perspective. Um, I did want to go ahead and ask if anybody, uh, so everybody passed the seventh, except for uh, Don who passed the sixth. Um, so I wanted to ask, uh, does, you know, uh, did anybody uh, gain some cool new uh, powers or new skills or spells that they're interested in showing off? Or anybody have anything that they want to, uh, they want to show off a little bit before we get started? <laughs> yeah, no. Great, great, that's fantastic. Oh, I all you guys got yeah. wait, 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 I'll start. I'll start. All right, all right. what did happen to you? So, uh, let's see. Uh, when when Gato woke up the next day, he had this uh, really bad headache. Okay. Um, and uh, he, since then, um, he seems just a little more uh, introspective, uh, seems to uh, think about things a little more before he charges in an ax or, or says something rash. Um, but uh, I am a little more stealthy. Uh, I, I, I can, uh, I think I can figure things out a little better. Um, but uh, yeah, just more, right. more of the same. So his experience in the bowels of Citadel Drazen changed him a little bit, sort of uh, gave him I, a bit more perspective, you know, to face death that closely well, in the I face. Will say, okay, so, how many people think that it was just me coming up with this altered personality on my own versus something that Les told me happened? I thought it was Les. <laughs> I was talking to Mike Friday night, and Mike's like, I can't figure out which one this is. I'm like, it was Les. Les <laughs> now, wait a me. second. It wasn't all me. It, I really it thought was, you were playing a schizophrenic character, Don. I really Les thought told me I was going insane and developing multiple personalities. Now, having said that, I came up with Linny all on my own. and all took that ball and ran with it. <laughs> yeah, I took it and ran. <laughs> so just, yeah, just to metagame a bit, one of the things that happened, those Discari creatures that actually knocked uh, Gatto out in that room, um, as you may have noticed, some of the creatures down in the basement of Citadel Drazen had powers of illusion that uh, transcended mere glamours. And uh, so the, these illusions have powers, power of their own from their uh, casters and from their controllers. So um, one of the things that uh, those, those, uh, those Discari creatures had was the power to, um, to drive you mad, if uh, um, quite mad indeed, if um, you were, uh, if you happen to uh, miss a few will saves and, uh, and end up on the ground like Otto did. So. Very interesting illusionary magic that uh, was getting tossed around quite a bit. I know that the usual case is that illusions don't, you know, don't really affect you. But in these cases, shadow illusions and shadow magic, they do. They absolutely do. Can't hurt you. You're in a variety of Psionic soon. Huh? So you're going to start playing psionic soon with all this weird <laughs> <laughs> It's all different kinds of magic, my friend. So anybody else? What uh, uh, Gordon, Jennifer, you guys, uh, um, Bardos, uh, I got some great new powers. He one can turn to shadow whenever he wants. Uh, teleports apparently, which is a great spell. Uh, <laughs> go back and forth between the planes and the, you know the kinds of things like that. And is pure evil, so that's a huge upgrade for Bardos. <laughs> I actually hey Matt. Hi all. Can you hear me? Yep. Hey Matt. Hi all. What were you saying, Gordon? That I did pick Dimension Door as one of my two new spells. I Did you? The, okay, great. The spell, so I got the mention door now, so I'm going to keep that in my back pocket with uh, what's going on. Get out of here, cool. please. Yep. Excellent. Hey, Matt. Hello, sir. How are you? We were just batting around, uh, you know, everybody going to seventh level, and if uh, anybody got some cool new abilities or uh, or things that they want to share. Um, how about Flashheart, Chosen of Ioma Day? Uh, uh, a wielder of radiance. Is there is it seventh level? How seventh level treat you, bud? I think seventh level just gives me more hit points. But I have to say that I, until twenty minutes ago, when I first started emails rolling in. I didn't. I didn't look. So <laughs> flash heart, Do you have a level up heart, either? Great. Yeah, that's fantastic. Flash hard. Ask uh, Ioma Day to set the snooze button today and uh, let him just you know, rest <laughs> a little bit more. He's, he's been pushing pretty hard for the last couple weeks. So. He's waking up like, hey, guys, you guys look a little more buff than yesterday. What's up? Oh, level. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> well, how about you, Chuck? What about Lothar? What uh, Lothar has come a long way since his days traveling to uh, Canebris with, uh, with, his, uh, with his friend and confidant and teacher. What, uh, what, what did 7th level, uh, anything you want to share with about 7th level for you? 
I'm still kind of working on it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> me too. I knew so, I knew I was seventh level three minutes ago. So uh, okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll be sure, you had to throw that in, Chuck. That just makes me look like a loser just because I'm a loser. I'll, I'll be with you in a minute. Okay. Uh, how about you, Dan? Well, what your characters would notice about uh, Fletcher is he uh, he doesn't take he doesn't get scrapes and little cuts on him anymore. He like you know branches and stuff that used to scar his arm or cut him if he went through stuff. He seems to just shrug that stuff off these days. Uh, little little bits of damage like that don't seem to hurt him. And he has a glow about him that also goes to his weapon, which now seems to have a magical glow to it. Huh. Nice. Well, that's a, that's a top off. Okay. I do have something to add for Flash right now, now that I've looked at it. So, <laughs> okay. uh, after, talking to, after consulting Iowa Day, she's decided to grant me three smites of evil per day, which is, uh, that's, uh, that, that's bringing the thunder when, I, when I'm going to pull that thing out. Very and my cool. ba- my bab inc- increased again, so it's going to be plus seven, plus two now. So that's pretty great. So I feel, uh, but I think in terms of mercies and everything else, uh, I get, I don't see anything else. My next big uh, buff is at ninth level. Okay. All right. At some point, I still haven't, I, I still haven't uh, figured out spells really for Flashheart. I could use help with that maybe from Don or somebody else who's, I, I, I can never figure out if I've done them right, like what level they should be at. Paladin spells. Right yeah. well, there should be there should be a chart. There is, and maybe I'm just be reading it wrong. It seems confusing. How about I, uh, during the week? I will send a I will send a note. Not during the not during the. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Cool. What what is your charisma? Uh, I believe it's twenty. Okay. So it's plus five. Yeah. So you'll have two first level and one second level. That's it. <laughs> spells hey, you for a paladin? Yes. Yeah, spells aren't really paladin. Uh, paladins aren't right. really spell based. Hey, you want All spells? Right. Become a bard, man. All right. Yeah, I might. I might multi-class into a bard next. Uh, next level. <laughs> that would be awesome. Uh, yeah. You just put some strings on radiance and just be like. Exactly. <laughs> strings and a strap. Well, okay. So, uh, uh, thank, sounds thank like. You, Don. Everybody, some a lot of people are still working on it, but uh, it sounds like Seventh has got some uh, good properties for everybody, and everybody's going to get something out of it. Um, I just want to take a quick trip back to last week. So a lot of things happened last week: the uh, the calling of the planetar, the destruction of Soul Share, the hanging of the banner, which uh, you know obviously Gordon complains about because I give you guys an artifact and then sort of take it away. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the arrival of uh, and the arrival of Irabet Terrorblade and the um, and the uh, you know the uh, uh, whole host of people from Canebras, two hundred soldiers uh, and four hundred support people, and you know over the course of time when she arrives, I mean, there's still this very palpable sense of the potential for counterattack, uh, and so those warriors just go right into defensive things. They're build, rebuilding the the. the the watchtowers, they're restaffing the bridge, they're uh, searching and, and clearing out any remaining tieflings or anything that are existing inside the, uh, uh, inside the, um, you know, inside the town. They're also trying to fix the broken parts of the castle. One of the things that these guys didn't do a whole lot of was castle repairs. Um, they frankly thought themselves invulnerable until about, uh, you know, a week and a half, two weeks ago. And so, um, you know, there's a fair amount of report. And that's where a lot of the support people came in. A lot of the people that Irabet, Irabet brought with her were, um, you know, like masons and carpenters and blacksmiths and wheelwrights and all those, all those kind of uh, uh, jobs that, um, you know, are, you know, when you're trying to put things back together. And Dresden as a town and the Citadel, frankly, to a, to a certain extent, has been largely you know, sort of destroyed, you know, a, a, a pale sort of reflection of his former strength and, 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 and you know, manufacturer. So, um, you know, a lot, suddenly those guys are, are, you know, just right in the weeds, getting, getting, building things back up, building a, uh, a barracks within the Bailey for the, uh, for the KEF under Geyer, um, you know, repairing these walls, getting these catapults, uh, you know, manufacturing ballista bolts to get all that stuff back together. Because, you know, frankly, the the um, the worry is that either the, te- you know, whoever escaped or the demons or the 
Templars of the Ivory Tower uh, uh, Tower are going to show back up and try and retake the Citadel. So they're in a they're in a hurry. I mean, the, just just devil's advocate here. They have mm-hmm. pretty much zero chance of doing that because because of the of the banner hanging on the wall. Only reason they took it the first place was through treachery. Well, correct, right. So, and it had been, and it had languished, you know, um, keep in mind that it has been like 70 years since Citadel Drazen fell from the treachery of Staunton Vane. And, and so, um, you know, yeah, they're not, you know, in, in, at no time in those 70 years has a, has a concentrated attack of this, this kind, uh, you know, sort of brought the fight to the Citadel. Frankly, this place was used as a base of operations for demonic activity in the, in the, what, in this region, which is called the Marchlands. But it's basically the northeastern segment of the world wound. Um, they didn't expect an attack like this. They certainly, uh, I, I think, at least initially, were prepared for it. Um, so these guys are sort of like preparing. For it. But you're absolutely right. The, the 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 presence of the banner creates that sort of demonic no fly zone. Uh, you know, a ten mile radius from the citadel, which prohibits. The, well, what it does is a lot of in. in I mean, one of the biggest benefits is it prohibits demons from teleporting in um, or teleporting out. But in this case, teleporting in. That's what you think when you hear about, when you hear some of the intelligence from the demons, from the interrogations coming back to you and say there was this moment where the demons, the demons who were here all sort of looked at each other and then were like disappearing, uh, teleporting away. They got some kind of indication or some kind of notice or, you know, some sort of disturbance in the force that they realized that this that the banner was live again, and uh, and that, that if they didn't get out quickly, they were never going to get out at all. So yeah, there's no way that they can kind of like do those those hit and run strikes using you know greater teleport at will that a lot of demons have uh, to try and get in here. So yeah, it really is uh, a, a a immensely powerful defensive bulwark. We need a we need a druid in the family here to, to go out there and start growing some plant life. Okay. Why would you want to? Uh, <laughs> you, mean like what, you mean like food or? No, no, just like you know, greening up the land of the world wound here. Oh, okay. Well, so that's another thing that you guys sure. have. In sure, the groom view itself has this. I mean, it's not a pleasant place. Yeah. So supplies are going to be an issue. Kind of ugly. Yeah, it's ugly. It's it's suffered suffered under the you know, for lack of a better term, the radioactivity of the world wound causes a lot of problems. Um, it, you know, it's it has a mutate a mutagenic effect. It has a desiccant effect. Um, you know, this is this used to be a uh, a pleasant if if northern land. You guys are well north of 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 uh, what would be, for example, the Canadian border here on the, you know, in a re- for a real world example. Um, but here it's still, you know, the temperature is disproportionately warm, um, you know, and the plants here are, are warped where they exist at all. And that's something that Irabet has talked about is like, how do we supply a large town um, when we can't, you know, there's, there's no agriculture here. There's, you know, uh, there's no way to do it. The water, uh, probably is not good to drink. Um, you know, these are the things that Irabet is worried about. So the last thing we did last time, uh, before the, the planetar destroying, uh, the soul share, um, was, um, Irabet's wife, Anivia coming up and, and, and saying that, you know, she had been conducting some interrogations of the captured tieflings. Now they'd have about 40, uh, 40 to 50 tieflings that did not, were not able to escape in time and that they recovered from various places, both within the Citadel and outside in, in the various town areas. Um, Anivia has taken about herself as uh, um, is sort of the role of interrogator, and she did find out some interesting things. Um, so the first one is the idea that there was, you know, a, a rivalry of sorts between the Templars and the Tieflings. The Templars thought that they were, you know, better than the Tiefling soldiers. Um, and always talked about, you know, the guy said they always talked about stratagems. They were always talking about strategy. Um, but basically he characterized them as a bunch of, a bunch of jumped up spies and not soldiers. 
Um, but he did say, the one thing that he did say that he thought is that their HQ was relatively close, about a week's ride away, although some people would say that it was to the south, some people said to the west. And so again, this idea that the, that the Templars are southwest of here, uh, this location continues to go. Now you've got a, maybe some distance uh, in the idea of that it's a week's ride, although frankly that was a guess on his part. Maybe he'd never been to anywhere. Um, the next bit of interesting information was some information about the prisoner from downstairs, the one that they had put gone to such pains to keep track of. Um, and we're talking, uh, we're talking the, the the not the lich, the, uh, the succubus, succubus. Not, not our guy in the toilet. Not your guy in the toilet who has uh, uh, joined back in with the warriors of Dresden and, and uh, who, frankly, I think I have to congratulate you, might be the first NPC uh, that has survived um, <laughs> surrendering to you guys and, and getting, uh, you got him back safely back to the surface and he lived. I can't believe it. Uh, I think the only one thing we do to, to, to keep up our streak is invite him back to the party for future adventures. <laughs> so you can come with you and get slain. No, he's not going anywhere near you guys from now on. So, um, but yeah, so yeah, you're exactly right. The succubus. And so the, the story goes from these interrogations is that she abandoned her demonic roots uh, and may well know the location of the Templar's HQ, like the exact location. Her name was Arushale, and she was a prisoner in the Citadel for weeks as a heretic. Although you can't really, you're not entirely sure what constitutes heresy among demons. Um, she escaped them despite their precautions, and Staunton Vane hired an Anis Hag, who is a cultist of a deity called Sifkesh, to try and track her down. Uh, uh, and he was always of the opinion that if this ant, this hag couldn't track her down, he intended to go recapture her himself uh, once he settled with you guys. This is 20 days ago uh, that this Annis hag uh, was, you know, that this this uh, succubus escaped and this Annis hag was set on her trail. You're not entirely sure what, which way she's gone, uh, but um, you know, if this is a if this is a creature that that has committed demonic heresy, which means maybe she's turned good? Who knows? I mean, uh, but if she has the, uh, knows the exact location of the Templar headquarters, that could be valuable information for you guys. So something to think about there. Um, third point was the idea that Staunton had some sort of fail-safe cooked up in, in case he was killed. Um, you're not sure what that was, but he didn't trust a Ponovicius. Um, but he, person that gave you this information doesn't think that it was the potion that his brother has made. Remember, his, uh, his brother had, had cooked up some sort of potion that um, would bring you back to life. It was a combination of the, uh, you know, various kinds of um, uh, liquids along with a um, philosopher's stone, which you guys recovered. Um, the last bit of information was that Aponovicius is down in the southern world wound, commanding a fair amount of tieflings and Templars along the Socorro River, which is northwest of Railscrad. Um, but she is aware of Staunton's failure. Now, Aponovicius is a Marilith, a demon, uh, and so her ability to teleport into Citadel Drazen has now been uh, blocked. But, um, you know, she's, she's well, apparently well aware of what's going, what, what has gone on. So you're not sure if that means that she's going to bring her armies back this way, or um, or just you know can you know write off Citadel Drazen as a lost cause and continue on with what she's doing down in the south. So, any questions about any of those kind of things? Anivia will actually take you down and introduce and, and sh let you talk to the to the tieflings who gave her this information, once the tieflings had been, you know, basically convinced that they weren't gonna be summarily executed, they actually became quite loquacious and were willing to talk uh, because they feel like they may be able to escape out of this thing alive, um, which frankly is a level of mercy that they would not have given the rest of you, but nevertheless. That's what makes us better. That's right, that makes you guys better. So questions, guys, anything like that? Is now um, the time to call for your dismissal? <laughs> sure, for what? Oh, Mike. Hey, guys. Yeah. Hey, Mike, Mike. Do what? Uh, Les, I sent you a note. Sorry, Mike. Oh, okay. Um, did, uh, my, uh, the carrier pigeon. Les, did, uh, <laughs> did, I don't think you mentioned yet uh, the dwarves have not arrived. 
Uh, they don't arrive. Hold on, let me check my thing. Uh, uh, no problem, Don. I will get back to you on that. Just want to uh, know so how we're going to do so, the, the hey, funny story about uh, Staunton Vane. It has been four days uh, since the um, uh, technically four, uh, technically three days since the um, since the Battle of Dresden uh, was finalized. Uh, you uh, they are supposed to arrive on day six, so. Uh, Three days from now, the the um, the dwarves arrive. Okay, questions, comments. All right. So the next day, um, you guys get a every everybody is sort of like putting things together, but you guys get a visitor, uh, somebody who you have seen before, uh, an older elven ranger named Valentin who has showed up at the gates of Citadel Drazen wishing to talk to all of you guys, um, plus Irabet, uh, plus Geyer, um, you know, and... Uh, and uh, we, don't, we don't let him in. You don't let him in? That's probably <laughs> smart. That was one of the elves that fell down with us into the... No, that was a female, right? The, the, Get out of here, you big loser! <laughs> so Valentin shows up, uh, and so hold on a second. Refresh my memory, who is that? So Valentin was the emissary of Queen Galfrey. Um, she, she's not one of the ones that fell into the pit with us, right, when we first started this campaign? Was uh, no, weeks. she didn't fall into the pit with you. She came to Kenebris later after you guys had gotten out of the pit and sort of <laughs> defanged the Wardstone thing. She was the one who sent you to Drazen. Yeah. Uh, you know, and basically has sort of said, okay, you guys are crusaders now uh, under my command. And, uh, you know, but she was like, look, maybe a guerrilla squad can work where um, – where a large army would not be able to. So, um, so Valentin, we, we correct her and say, obviously it didn't. <laughs> obviously, yeah, this didn't work. Um, but no, Valentin was her emissary when she can't be there. She's obviously fighting in the South and commanding the forces there. Um, so Valentin is her emissary to you. And uh, so he comes and uh, basically is like, um, uh, you know, I want to meet with everybody. And, uh, you know, everybody, you know, Irabet sets up a, a conference room in the, in the Citadel. Everybody sits down and, you know, there's like uh, that kind of stuff. And, and Valentin says, I have uh, brought with me a, um, a, uh, a scroll from you to you from Queen Galfrey, uh, which I will show you now. And you can see pictures of Queen Galfrey and Valentin there. That's Valentin right there. Looking pretty sleek. Um, but he unrolls the scroll, and basically, uh, this is how it reads. To the liberators of Dresden, words cannot convey my gratitude for what you have done. I wish I could say that the worst is over, but as you must surely know, the liberation of Dresden is but the first of many steps. You are poised to serve the crusade in a way that no others among my forces can match. Use the citadel as your base of operations and explore the wounded lands to the south and west, seeking out anything else we can use against the demonic hordes and thwarting their efforts as you are able. Being on the front lines, you have already likely found some lines of investigation that could prove fruitful. My associate Valentin is well-versed in the region's history and legends. Word of your successes in Dresden's liberation has started to spread and already I see renewed hope in the faces of my soldiers. They fight with renewed hope. Our increased tenacity along the southern border should keep the eye of Discari turned away from you, affording you time to explore and engage in guerrilla operations behind enemy lines. Disrupt the enemy wherever you may find him. Use tactics that are based on gathering intelligence, ambush, deception, sabotage, and espionage, undermining the demonic through low-intensity confrontation. With your efforts, I'm beginning to think that victory is something for which we can once again hope. Signed, Queen Galfrey, Iomadeus, Clippius, at Derego Ferro. And the signal, the sign of the, the Queen of Mendev right here. So, a uh, letter from the Queen. Very nice. And as she says, Valentin is well-versed in the region's history and legends. And one of the things that he will say is, um, uh, he's like, I want to uh, give you a little bit of history about the Templars of the Ivory Labyrinth. And so what he says is the Templars of the Ivory Labyrinth joined the demonic forces of the world wound in 4660. To give you an idea of, um, of the current, it's, it's 4717, I believe, is the current year. Hold on just a sec. 
to confirm that. Uno momento, por favor. We're talking about 57 years or so? Yeah, we're in 4717. So, no, more like 117 years ago. Okay. Uh, so it's 4717. This is in 40. Oh, no, 4660 to 47. Yeah, 75 years ago. Right around at the same time that Citadel Dresden. <laughs> Uh, sorry, math isn't really my strong. It's one of those, it's like 2,003 million, somewhere in there. Yeah, it's somewhere in there. Uh, plus or minus uh, uh, a thousand. Um, so this was soon after Discari recruited the Templar Lord Baphomet to the cause. Uh, basically, he tells you that he uh, that Discari uh, promised uh, Baphomet prime picks of Golarian to carve away and add to his abyssal realm once the war had been won. Uh, these Templars were experts in infiltration, and they were largely responsible. They infiltrated basically the Crusaders and in large part uh, ruined the Second Crusade uh, because they pretended to be Crusaders on the side of, on the side of good. Um, they were largely responsible for, for instigating the Canebrus witch burnings of 4665. Um, but they had long before, but long before this, they had become established in the region, working as mercenaries for Discari's generals, and even as unaffiliated bounty hunters in the, in the borderlands. In those early days, the Templar efforts were orchestrated none other than by someone none other than Baphomet's own daughter, uh, a half fiend Nephilim named Hepmira, Hep, Hepzamira. But as the organization grew, she increasingly relied on assistance and. Is, uh, basically what our intelligence told us is that without question her favorite and most loyal minion was a man named Xanther Vang, uh, an accomplished conjurer and an influential member of another vile group, the group, the Blackfire Adepts. With Xanther's aid and with the arcane support granted by the Adepts uh, loyal to him, the fortunes of the Templars of the Ivory Labyrinth rose, and by the time Discari officially recruited them um, and their Lord Baphomet, Hep Zamira had already returned to the Abyss to serve her father, leaving Xanther Vang in charge of the operations in the World Wound. Xanther was slain during the Third Crusade, during one of the few military operations that worked. Uh, but uh, um, at the time, he was rumored to have been working with Arilu Vorlesh and Hep Zamira, and, uh, to be developing some method of refining the hydrian crystals to concentrate their potency. Now, you remember that the planetar told you that the crystals that you found inside the chimera when you first uh, infiltrated the citadel were niahydrian crystals that had somehow been distilled, was the word that the planetar used. But Valentin uses the word refined. So apparently these Nihydrian crystals are important to their operation. And this Xanther guy, before he died, was uh, a key guy uh, amongst these guys for, for refining these crystals. I can't hear the word Xanther without thinking of that, the, the 90s uh, pan flute guy. The pan flute guy, yeah. So it, this, this particular Xanther may or may not have a pan flute. Yeah. It's just as evil. Just as evil. Maybe even more so. So that's basically what he knows about uh, about the Templars. Is there? Um, but what he also uh, has to show you is because of because that the Queen has asked you to engage in um, in uh, um, you know guerrilla operations. He's like, we should take a look and see what we know about this region uh, of the uh, of the Marchlands of the of the northeastern world. And here is what we know. So this is a map of the known marchlands. Can you see that? Yep. Okay. Uh, so where you are, obviously Citadel Drazen, uh, up here surrounded by the green circle. Now you can see it has a, uh, the hex uh, is marked in green, as are uh, the cleared temple, Keepers Canyon, Villareth Ford, uh, and the path uh, south is marked in green. These are areas which you have taken and continue to hold. Um, the Vrock swarms, as you can see, are, are, um, are noted in orange here. That's where the Vrocks and the swarms were. Citadel Drazen uh, is surrounded by a green area, um, which indicates that it is generally speaking free from, uh, from demonic and uh, um, you know, uh, military forces. The smaller green hex within there is the 10 mile radius of the thing. Now I've used a hex because we're using a hex map here, uh, but um, basically it's a 10 mile circle around Citadel. The no fly That's zone. the no fly zone, yeah. So as you can see, 
this region, not much is known. I mean, so to the south and west, I've already marked that there may be some Baphometians down there. Uh, you can see that the arrow pointing to the world wound is due, due to west. The wounded lands is uh, the region down to the southwest. Um, each of these hexes is about 12 miles long. So um, just to uh, um, just to meta a little bit, your uh, your re the request from Queen Gaufrey is basically um, for you guys to investigate this region, finding and scuttling any plans of the uh, of the enemy that you may determine. It's a large map. Each of these hexes is about 12 miles long, um, but at this point. You've got a sandbox, people. So real quick, um, this is this is pretty exciting. It certainly expands the world a lot. Um, real quick, um, the uh, Galfrey's orders are mostly party related. It's to the FUP, not to the army that sits here, right? Correct. That, that that particular weird. scroll was directed at the at the uh, right. the Fellowship of Unwilling Participants, not to the army. So Geyer was given a, battle, a, a battlefield commission from Iribet when she arrived and basically placed him in charge of the, placed him in charge of the um, remaining Canebran Crusaders. And they changed the name of it to the first Canebran Expeditionary, uh, Expeditionary Force, the KEF. So Geyer, Geyer Windall uh, is now, uh, he's not uh, part of your coterie anymore. You're not in charge of him anymore. He's in charge of the, um, of the Crusaders. Of the of the of the KEF, he probably goes around daily saying, "You can't tell me what to do anymore." You can't tell me what to do anymore. <laughs> like he, he tells us, as he passes in the hall, it's first bunch of days. jerks, almost yeah. got me killed. <laughs> mostly, um, yeah, mostly, mostly, Gary doesn't have to mask his contempt for our uh, <laughs> our abilities anymore. Uh, uh, so, so what guy? Are, so, I mean, so this is an interesting point. So, this this is um, so the two hundred people that Irabet brought with her the 200 warriors and one can assume that when general harlecart gets here his he's coming with 500 dwarven heavy foot uh so um you know one assume because this because citadel drazen was a dwarven constructed citadel this is a dwarven fort um and harlecar is back here to sort of take it now whether harlecar and irabet get together because irabet was named warden warden of dresden um but it the in the in the short term, those 200 guys are basically Citadel Defense Forces, right? Whereas Geyer in the KEF, um, I mentioned earlier that this region is very bare. There's no agriculture here. There's very few sources of, of potable water. Um, you know, clerics can bring something, but you, when you have now well over 800 people are now in Dresden, and there's likely to, that's likely to double or, or almost double very soon. Um, you know, those people have to be supplied. So what the initial orders and Geyer would tell you, I mean, you, you would be party to these discussions is Geyer's the first, um, you know, Geyer's initial orders are that the KEF is, is to keep the supply lines open. If you were a bunch of ivory temp, if you were an army of Templars and you'd just been kicked out of Citadel Drazen, but you knew that these guys had a, had a supply line that stretched about how, how long, how far away did we say Canepris was about, about, was it about 90 miles? Yeah. I can't remember. Anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a ways. Uh, most of, most of Dresden's supplies right now have come directly from Canebras and probably will continue to do so in the near future. That supply line is long and tenuous. So these little places like Villareth Ford and Keepers Canyon, these are, these are essentially, this, that blue line is essentially the path by which supplies are coming to Dresden from Canebras. It's the Oregon Trail. Yeah, it's the Oregon Trail. It's the same path you guys took here. So the you died of dysentery and Brock. <laughs> <laughs> you Brock. You've you've succumbed to Brock. Um, but from from Geyer, I mean, the, the the first job of the KEF is to keep those supply lines open. So they are going to be working on the on the west side of the Selen River to make to in, to make sure to interdict any any raiders or. Um, or uh, recon re reconnaissances in force by whomever uh, wants to try and interdict those supply lines. It's the it's so, smart play. So I have two additional questions. Maybe the other party members have things to, to go over. But one, uh, do we have quarters in the uh, in the in their citadel? Do we make ourselves at home in some of the former housing that's lying around in the ruins of the of the town here? It's okay. Okay. I think I think the assumption, at least on Irabet's part, was that you guys would make your quarters in the Citadel, um, right. just for the mere fact that it's protected. 
um, these craftsmen that she brought with you, these 400 stonemasons and stuff, they're actually building soldiers' quarters in the in the in the bailey of the citadel. That's where the KEF is based. So they're not so much tents, although that's where they're staying now as as they're being constructed. But eventually there will be wood and stone buildings within the bailey. And if you wanted, if, if you needed something like that, certainly that would be made available to you. Yeah. You also Flash have a calls, town. Though. There's a whole town yeah. out there. Right. In the beginning, Flashheart calls dibs on the closet where the party survived the night <laughs> under an illusion. Uh, you that was almost, it to your own place? That was an almost a TPK there if we hadn't hidden behind that, uh, uh, I think, was, was it uh, Ray's wall? Somebody's wall. It was wall Bardos. Was. Bardos uh, raised an illusionary wall. The long, was, yeah. uh, and I said Ray, too. That's wrong. Wrong campaign. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Farina. Um, the uh, okay, yes, that's that'll be uh, and it's windowless, so that'll be flash arts place to for contemplation, coffee and contemplation. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but during the last session, towards the end of it, we had a couple of uh, hooks to look up, but I think they both dealt with going due south. Yeah, the one was the succubus. Uh, so you don't know which way the succubus is. I mean, you, you don't know. I mean, you might go want to press that guy uh, who saw the Anis hag as to which maybe he knows which direction she was, but it wasn't something Anivia got out of it. It might not even have been a question. <laughs> not question not hard to ask if a bunch of guys are interested where the succubus ran off to. Other question I have is with these freaking yeah. demons flying around and the rocks flying around and stuff, we seem to be limited by moving around on foot or horseback. Do we have any ability? How many how many abilities do we have that could get us to fly more, or are there are there captive creatures or domestic we're, creatures? We're going on horseback fly? because Flashheart is going to use his mount. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I haven't I haven't pulled that mount out yet. This is the part yeah. I love the best. Is when is when Don chastises fellow players for not knowing, <laughs> not, not knowing the signals. Yeah. <laughs> you, you didn't min max your character properly. <laughs> um, so anyway, I just it just occurs to me that we got a long a lot of uh, uh, shoe leather to burn here. But if we had some sort of ability to fly from location to location, it might save us some time. I don't know. Can anybody catch fly? From Pegasus. <laughs> If we, can we, if we enlarge uh, Storm each time, how many smart people can Storm Carl, Gary? Uh, well, that's a good question. How about it, Mike? If, uh, you, enlarge, if you enlarge Storm, which doesn't last long, weight-wise, she can carry probably almost the whole party. It's it's a matter of – it's kind of like the whole uh, Monty Python thing. It's, it's not a matter of how they carry – if they can carry the weight, it's how they grip it. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you could you – could... Put like a like a whole thing of saddles on top of them. Like, yeah, you know, we'll we'll build saddles. we'll build a long line of uh, seats and you just grab the bar and take like it. a bus. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, weight wise, <laughs> when she's enlarged, I think it's like I think it's like sixteen hundred pounds or something like that she can carry and still fly. Mm. So well, that's, that's not nearly as much as you think it is. Well, that's yeah, probably, probably like about six or hours. seven people at least. Flash heart well, and plate mail is probably about five. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's, it's magic plate mail, so it's a it's lighter, right? I don't know, it's, it's made of helium. Yeah, you got a couple of elves. I mean, and their equipment might be pushing maximum density. I would have to do the math on it, but it, it's it's possible. But like I said, it's a matter of she she's if you, if you think of Storm, she's kind of a, her body is about the size of a tiger with wings. Okay. So I, I'm just thinking that we, we, we deal with people, and and even that it's. It actually says in the rules, she cannot be used as like a normal mount until yeah, she is so. one category larger than whatever she's carrying. Well, her she's, she's still I, medium, right? Yeah, she's still medium, so yeah. she's probably like a small tiger with wings. I was just curious. Oh, oh, like we're, we're facing a lot of guys who fly. Yeah. So. Do succubuses fly or do they teleport? Well, uh, how many... Uh, how much access to the spell fly do we have? That's a great question. I've not picked my my one second. Thing third to say, oh, we'll just fly there. It's another thing to find out that one of our guys can cast it once a day. Right. Yeah. Well, we can spend the next couple of weeks writing scrolls, but uh, that <laughs> will slow down everything. Yeah. Keep in mind, Bardos is MIA too, guys. He's right. Bardos is our guy to do that, and he's not here. 
Yeah, that's that should be our primary focus: recovering Bardos before we yes, and maybe hopefully come up against some of these other things. And we're, do we have no idea? Do we do we have a, a signal on Bardos? We think, we think no, he's with whatever wherever the Baphomedians are. Well, Baru would yeah. tell you that as far as he could, as far as Baru could tell, he's still alive. Uh, and he feels like he's to the south and west, but he can't get a beat on him. As far as that, he he, he could be he could be a mile away. He could be a hundred miles away. All right. So besides that's, just par- that's party first level. and foremost to uh, to Gato. Yeah. Besides party yeah. level uh, of uh, you know death and destruction honest, that the club can bring, what else? Can we yeah, Elendar is not going to last anything else as, as long as he has any say. So Here, here's what I'll do, Les. I, I'm going to talk to Guy and say. We're thinking about taking on the bath many to look for our pal uh, Bardos. Um, and we don't know what kind of strength they have. I'd certainly like to see them wiped out. If we're able to establish um, some sort of scouting or uh, 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 ability for him to get additional information, would he be considered, would he consider sending a, a, a larger force to help mop them up? Yeah, absolutely. He would. Uh, if you if you guys can discover, the nest, absolutely. He'd be he 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 would be very much interested in doing that. And he's a paladin too, right? So he's got to be paladin, yeah. Yeah. So oh, uh, any of us, yeah, any of us who are paladin especially hate the Bathmanians. So oh yeah, because they're such jerks. Yeah. And then to remind me what Delamere's tomb is. So so this is something that Valentin would tell you. Uh, so Delamere's tomb. So um, so there's yeah. So on the map that you had, the maps that you have, there's three in there's three places that are that are indicated there. Um, so Delamere's tomb, uh, Valentin would tell you is um, you know before the world wound opened, the Delamere the region of Delamere's tomb was a complex series of crypts and vaults that was sacred to uh, a subcult of a rastal. Uh, that lived there. Uh, today, um, as far as people know, a rift has destroyed much of the complex, leaving behind only a relatively small cavern through which flows a river of molten rock. The last keeper of that place was an, uh, a Rastelian priest named Jesper Helton, who, dis- who disappeared from contact several years ago. Uh, now, now, you guys might wonder why you know this, the world wound has been open for so long, but uh, a small chapel to Erastal was still able to survive. Primarily, it, was survive, it survived because it was overlooked. Uh, it's, it's a small place, uh, a humble wooden chapel with a stone foundation. It's maybe two rooms, uh, the temple and then the personal chamber. Um, Delamere, uh, Lo- I'm sorry, go ahead. Isn't, isn't Lothar Erastal, uh, Erastalian or whatever? He is indeed. And I imagine Lothar's Lothar's eyes widened a little bit. Lothar, you would have known the name Delamere uh, as the name of an old Sarkorian priestess. This region before the world before the world would open was a place called Sarkoris, uh, and Delamere was the name of an old Sarkorian priestess of Arastal. Um, Valentin actually at that point says. Uh, to Irabet, have you have you discovered any libraries here in the Citadel? And she said, yeah, there was a bunch of books, but that kind of stuff. And, and Valentin says, hold on a second. I'm going to go look for something. And so he he takes off and about, oh, almost an hour later, you guys are sitting there with your thumbs up, you're about talking with Irabet. And, you know, oh, how are things in Canabas? Oh, they're great. How are things here? You know, um, suddenly Valentin shows back up and in his hands, he's got this book. Uh, it's dirty. It's filthy. He's like, I thought there may be a copy here. I always suspected that there was a copy here. Um, and uh, uh, he sort of waves it a little bit at uh, at Lothar, whom he knows is a, is a, is a cleric of Arastal. And he says, I found a copy of the Stag King's Bride. I thought there was a copy here. And so Lothar, you would know this book. Um, it's considered to be almost heretical. Uh, 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 teachings of Erastal. Basically, it's an account of the priestess of Erastal named Delamere, who taught that cities were among the greatest blights that humanity has ever conceived, and that any settlement of more than 53 citizens is inherently evil. According to Delamere's bizarre and sometimes incomprehensible teachings, the 54th person in any settlement has an unusually high chance of being a traitor, based on, in part on the theory that a family of five lies at the center of six families of five, grandparents, cousins, nieces, and nephews. The 54th person, therefore, would be outside of the family and therefore a danger. Um, Lothar, you know that Delamere's teachings were controversial. You've never read this book, but you know a little bit about it. But you also would remember that in the smaller towns of northeastern Sarkoris, 
Delamere gained enough popularity that when she died, she was buried in a tomb, hence Delamere's tomb. Um, since that time, the families of those who follow her teachings were each assured a place in the tomb. Uh, according to the final page of the book, which, um, which Valentin would show you, uh, it says uh, there's a single short message written in ink. And it says, Delamere has the right of it. Dresden is too big for its own good. A trip to her tomb to search for more of her teachings may be in order. There's no signature, but Valentin will tell you that he believes that this may be Jesker Helton's handwriting. Because it is known, it, it is known that he was, um, you know, that he passed through uh, Dresden uh, at some point. Now, this is all very weird because Dresden has been a place dominated by demons and tieflings and Templars for 70 years. Um, Hesker uh, was, no, or this Helton, I'm sorry, Jesker Helton, this Helton guy disappeared from, from, from sight, according to Valentin, probably, you know, five or six years ago. So there's, in this part of the world, there's apparently been a lot of like mishmashy kind of stuff where people are going back and forth, that kind of stuff. But that's Delamere's tomb. This is essentially an Aristotelian tomb um, uh, for a near heretical um, woman who believed cities sucked. I believe I saw the movie, Ron Jeremy was in it, right? The statue, One second. Right? Hold on a second. No. Yeah. Hey. What do you want? Oh, hey, congratulations. Yeah. That's awesome. I went from the first to the second. First to the Fantastic. Good for you. That's awesome. Okay. And he did a great job. Congrats, dude. Sorry, Dad. No, that's all right. I laid James two times. My, uh, my son did his first drive on the highway tonight. Congratulations and terrifying. <laughs> Thanks for letting us be driving the area now. Yeah, just, yeah, you want to you wanna stay, stay close to home. But yeah, that's Delamere's tomb. Excellent. Well, we can put that on the list there, uh, uh, Lothar. Well, I'm writing down an order on the map. Yeah, I see it. Wasn't Ron Jeremy in the movie right before Dirty Debbie Con? It was uh, in, the, in the Stag King's Bride. Yeah, I believe that's, uh, yeah. I mean, it's you know, one of those things like that, that accidentally shares a, shares a title. <laughs> it's just, the name of that book just made me laugh. Um, the, uh, all right, so... Let's go find our pal Bardos first. And then Sesker's Gully, again, what was that again? So Sesker's Gully is a small ghost town that sits on the northern bank of the Ahari Riverbed. Um, it was a crusader-founded town that was abandoned after the Second Crusade. It remains abandoned. Okay. And then the, the, the rock swarms here seems like sitting right on top of our supply line. Well, that's, so that's, so that's that just a marker. That's where you guys fought that rock and ran into the swarms. Mm -hmm. It's not swarms of rocks. It's where you guys fought the Brock in the swarm. So as that's, far as you that, know, there's, did you guys ever get rid of those swarms? Is that, is that where the crevice was, was coming yeah. from, the, from the other plane? Yeah. I don't, I don't recall. Yeah, I don't believe we did. Yeah, we need to have somebody address that because there was some kind of rift there, right? That was mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah. We, we need to call a rift, a rift repairman. <laughs> the, and then the Lost Lake to the Sun there, Lake Lost to the Sun. Uh, the, so the Lake Lost of the Sun is basically just a, a large lake to the northwest of where you guys are now. Um, it's uh, it's a world wound lake. Uh, honestly, the water is not fit to drink. All right, good guys. But look, we can get this thing repurified with our Paladin powers. Get some beachfront property right here. We can turn this place around and flip. A sixteen ocean view. Yeah, yeah, we'll flip. We'll flip the world wound yeah. to a profit. <laughs> All right, uh, and then Villa for Winter Sun. What's Winter Sun again? Winter Sun. All right, so this is this is a weird story. Valentin sort of was like, all right, you got to sit down for this one. Um, I got many, some mead. Many Sarkorians fled their homeland when the world would open, uh, abandoning their lands to save their lives. A guy named Marhavak Grunhild Winter Sun was the descendant of a guy named Korag Grunhild Winter Sun. Uh, a clan liege who initially made the choice to stay behind and resist the first wave of demons. Um, this wave was eventually driven back by the first crusade and Korag's family commended it for his bravery. When the second crusade failed to do the same against the larger, more organized demon attack, the Grunhild winter sons fled into Mendev, east into Mendev. But when they did so, they brought with them an unwanted and unexpected uh, um, presence. For in staying stubbornly behind at first, old Korag, 
allowed uh, his family to be exposed to demonic energies and they infected them. And ever since children born to the clan have suffered. In the least unfortunate circumstances, a baby might be born with a vestigial tail or a deformed foot, while in the worst, um, sometimes they get a snapping, hissing, demonic monstrosity that distraught mothers were always quick to put down. These were rough times and rough places. Um, Marhavak, Grunhild Winterson, Korag's great-great-grandson, didn't escape the family's curse. Although when he was first born, it seemed that he had. It wasn't until he had helped defend his family from a demonic attack that the sinister nature of his abyssal influence manifested himself. Maravak had followed in his parents' footsteps uh, and became a barbarian upon coming of age, and his barbaric rage and power saved his family from destruction at the hand of a, hands of a pack of babaos. But after being gravely injured in the fight, this is on the eastern side, which is in Mendev, where they were living, not in the world. Maravak found that whenever mm -hmm. he entered a rage, his body would twist and deform into that of a fiendish brute. The touch of a demon's claw was all that was needed to unlock his inner demon, demonic nature, and as his power grew, so did his madness. He had three brothers uh, in Mendev who once tried to remove him from power over the clan, but he slaughtered them, and when they did, the rest of the clan fell meekly into line. Uh, Maravak realized that Mendev was no longer really a good home for him, and he led his frightened but code family west into the back into the world womb to claim their ancestral home. Now, this is only about four months ago. Winter Sun was always the the uh, ancestral homeland of the of the um, Grunhild Winter Sun Winter Sun clan, uh, but it had been abandoned until about four months ago. Now, this Maravak and his family, however many of them there are, have returned there. And so, so a bunch of uh, demonically influenced barbarians are chilling in the winter in winter sun. Well, not demonically influenced. So, the world wound itself um, emits a sort of weird magical radiation, um, and because of his great grandfather, great great grandfather's proxy, you know, he he basically said, "I'm not leaving," and he fought off demons as best he could. Basically, was you know was somewhat successful. Uh, and the and the Crusaders of the First Crusade were able to relieve him and 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 you know fight that back. It was during the Second Crusade that the family had to sort of tear out of there. But the, they were exposed to this too much of this world wound radiation, and it affected their genetics. Uh, and so you know there's a there's a solid chance that any baby born into that family, you know, maybe a little bit teeth, even though they're not actually uh, um, they're not actually tieflings per se. Well, at most, there should only be 35 of them because the 36th one will be uh, bad. Oh, no, they're not, they're not Arastilians. Um, and they're certainly not Delamarians. <clears throat> one other thing for Delamere's tomb uh, is it was a, um, and Lothar, I don't know if you would know this, but um, certainly Valentin would, that it had been a a place where Erastal followers, um, regardless of whether they follow Delamere or not, would uh, stop to rest or, or rejuvenate, get food, water. It was considered a safe place for Erastal uh, people moving out of the world wound to try and stop before they crossed over the Selen River. It was considered a way station of sorts. All right, we'll put it on the, uh, on the vacation list. All right, I guess everybody get your sunscreen and uh, get some supplies. So we should probably head on, uh, head on out there and look for Bardos. What, what, what do we think? Do we well, wanna... before you do, it's not too many days before. Uh, uh, oh, it's only for the dwarves. Two days later, Harlekar arrives, and okay. you can so you can so you guys uh, talk with Valentin and sort of help uh, get things together um, with. Um, with, uh, um, you know, Irabet and Anivia. Did you have any other questions for the, uh, for the tieflings that she, um, that, she, that Anivia was interrogating, you know, the prisoners? Um, Don? Yeah. Are you going to grab your torch and uh, question the prisoners? <laughs> <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> 
Well, yeah, they're not that, torturing that, that them. Was, so, yeah, uh, that was very dark for a paladin to say. Let me retry that yeah. again. Yeah, they're I, actually, I, I, you know, they're I can't actually, think of something interesting to ask them. So that's um, you know, they're talking. So I mean, they're. I mean, you don't have to torture them. If you have questions for them, they'll. You can ask. Well, them. we could torture them. You could, yes. <laughs> and as and as lawful good that's crusaders. Insane. But I'm not good. <laughs> the use of torture is probably, you know. Yeah, you know, that's why, that's why I chose Don, but uh, I chose Gato. But on top of that, it, you know, if we did act in an evil way, it's not because our alignments are changing. It's, it's uh, the effect of the whirlwind. Yeah, it's the radiation. <laughs> yeah. I, oh, I, didn't, I didn't want to do twist and sick things. It was the radiation. All right. <laughs> this, is, this, is why, uh, this is why Flash Art needs some time to himself to, you know, Cleans himself of sin <laughs> sinful uh, thoughts. We know why he needs some time to himself. <laughs> Forget the Knights Templar. <laughs> yeah, tell me a little more about the succubus. The nice succubus. Uh, so, um, all, so did, did, all, you, did you say uh, nice succubus? Well, well, the, yeah. So what the this heretical succubus? What this I was thinking about that. But go ahead. What this tiefling would tell you is, you know, he's like, look, I didn't know much. Uh, it turns out that this guy was one of the one of the people that was part of the servants that would actually help help um, the demons and stuff like that to sort of like uh, you know bring her food and that kind of stuff. So he had talked with her a little bit. Um, the nature of her heresy was that she had essentially turned good. She had renounced her demonic heritage. She didn't want a par any part of this world wound stuff anymore, and so they were holding her in this very specialized cell at Citadel Drazen so that when Aponavisius came back, the idea was that Aponavisius was going to teleport her back to the abyss for, um, you know, for what they called uh, uh, re-education. Reprogramming? Uh, reprogramming, right. So, and, and the team will say, look, the, the defenses around this, the cell were prodigious. Uh, and she managed to slip out. Nobody really knows how she got out. Um, but Staunton okay. knew that. Uh, She's a succubus. Elinor knows exactly how she got out. <laughs> Elinor's <laughs> like, well, not in Menzo no Baranza. Really did it. <laughs> Back in Menzo Baranza, we know how everybody gets out of jail. Um, so she's, they're not. So this tiefling is not entirely sure how she escaped, but I think Elinor might have a clue as to how something like that might have happened. Either way, uh, Aponavisius was gone when this happened. Um, it was only like 20, 21 days ago that she escaped. So Vane, knowing that um, Aponavisius was gonna have his ass, if, uh, that his prisoner, her prisoner had escaped, uh, he had this anise hag that he knew of, that who was supposed to be a great tracker. And he put, he hired her to put her on the, on the on the uh, payroll to send, um, you know, to go find this this succubus and get her back here before Aponavisius returned so that uh, Staunton Vane didn't get, you know, his ass handed to him by his boss. Um, when you ask this guy um, which way the hag went, hold on a second, he'll tell you that, you see the blue, can you see the blue arrow, the light blue arrow? He'll say that when she, he goes, I don't know where she went after she got out of, uh, out, out of, out of uh, the Citadel, but when she left, she was headed due east. West, sorry, due west. Yeah. All right, well, that's on the way to the Bath Minions, so maybe we, we hit the Bath Minions first, we'll check out what's there, and then uh, meander up that way towards the Blue Arrow. Gentlemen, lady. Yep. Start out, then turn south. But don't go near the gully because that's 18th on our list. <laughs> three and a half. Who's putting three and a half on there? <laughs> Don's having a good time. Don's, <laughs> Don's handling it. All right. Yeah, Gatto's, you, Gatto's handling the map. All right. Make sure you start using letters and or like uh, uh, weird Sanskrit symbols. Now. <laughs> like a, why, why is there a tilde in the letter? The low, <laughs> <B here>? the <laughs> tilde. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So uh, the dawn of day six arrives. All right. So uh, we all have horses, right? Because we, we came in on them. Uh, we will all, I guess. Uh, get Can I get a supplies. horse? I didn't have one. Uh, yes, so you, will be, you, will, you will be able to get horses. Do we get free riding levels uh, for people who don't have I think everybody had okay horse levels. Um, then we have, 
so 12, 24, 36 to where the basket may have been, 36 back, that's 72. So, um, so there's a couple so, of rules that apply to the investigating these hex maps. Now you can cross over these things. So what I've done, just to, oh, hold on, I'm gonna turn off the dwarf music. Um, you don't hear the dwarf music. You didn't hear the dwarf music? I heard it. Yeah, okay, yeah. good. Uh, I have a hearing aid though, so sorry. All right, cool. So, um, so the thing about investigating uh, these things is it takes uh, an entire day to investigate a hex. So what I've done is I have the hex map here. And what I've done is I've put uh, individual, uh, here, I'll just show you. I've put individual hexes, uh, covers over on the hex. So if you were to go this way, for example, uh, down by Villareth Ford and you investigated this hex, it would go away and you would see that there's nothing there, right? So as you guys uh, investigate the map and take the time to investigate it, I will remove the covers from the hexes, from the hexes of the maps. So you will be able to, to find potentially new places, potentially new things, uh, that kind of stuff. Now it takes a full day to investigate a hex. Uh, there's a couple of things, to travel through a hex though is linear travel. You don't get to pull the cover off of it. You're just traveling through, you only see a, a line of it. You don't get to, you have to investigate it, to pull the cover off a hex, you have to spend the day to investigate it. Now, a couple of things. You have horses, which is great. Um, you can still only do one hex on horseback. Uh, but here's the thing. There's no water here, or at least no water that you know of, and there's no food. Now, I know that, uh, you know, clerics can manufacture, you know, food and water out of thin air uh, by the power of their deities, which is great, uh, and that may suffice. But you also have horses with you. Um, honestly, this, the, 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 this area out here is not a good place to be. Uh, and as you move further west, it becomes even less of a cool place to be. So unless they have invented chuck wagons since we were last uh, um, in, in Mendev or whatever, uh, maybe, we'll, uh, or maybe we'll just take a couple pack horses with us and take it's possible, one, two, yeah. I mean, you could three, do that. Four, I'm, just gonna, five, I'm just gonna read you a six, little right thing. We'll, that, we'll take at least one horse for, Bar, for, uh, for Bardos, too, in case we find him, plus a couple pack horses or whatever else you'll give us. I'm going to read you a quick, uh, a quick quote from Cedric Mercadian, who was a crusader uh, with a company called the Order of the Rising Sun. And this is, he was put in charge. He was, he was a guy that you sort of uh, maybe had known of back in Canebris. But basically, he was, he, he was one of the guys that was in charge of training new recruits and, and new volunteers how to deal with things in the world wound. And this is, this is what he used to tell them on their first days. He said, heed these rules, you lot. Don't eat anything you didn't bring in with you. Don't drink any water you haven't boiled. Don't touch anything that's growing. Hell, don't touch anything that's dead either. You know what I touch here in the world wound? The only thing, only things that came in with me and haven't left my sight. That's what. That's why I'm still alive after five years on the line, and that's why half of you will be dead by the end of one. If you don't want to be included in the dead half, follow orders, watch your fellows, and keep your eyes sharp, and don't touch anything. That's my rules for when I leave the... Uh... The train in New York to, and walk to my office. Don't touch anything. <laughs> yes, it's, good, it's a good rule in New York, and it's a good rule yeah. here. Don't take any flyers from weirdos. Don't touch CDs that are offered to you. <laughs> CDs. Yeah. I actually took a CD from a guy. I couldn't believe it. I was such a sucker. Hey, Mike, uh, question? Yep. Mike? Mike? Yes, yes, it does. Cool. Thank you. Wait, are you guys asking each other questions that I don't know about? Not at all. Carry on. Hey. <laughs> we would never do that at all bunch of wieners um so yeah so um yeah foraging for food i mean there might be places i mean obviously most of the templars are human uh or chiefly they've got to eat and drink and um the templars that you've seen and fought did not seem to be overly affected by um you know, by the demonic radiation. It might have been it might have been something that was much more prominent during the early phases of the world loom and less so here. It might be more diffuse here. But nevertheless, um, they seemed okay. So it's possible that there will be places that you go, especially if you attack Templar uh, facilities or Templar areas, that you can find, uh, you know, uh, edible food and potable water. Um, but 
foraging in the in the wastelands is probably not a, a good idea. So I guess my question is, do you have a cleric who's willing to sacrifice a couple of spells a day to make sure you guys are fed in water? And remember, you have to do the same for your horses, too. A seventh level cleric casting at once can feed 21 people. A horse equals three people. <laughs> you just made that up. That's in Create Food and Water. A horse equals three people? Uh, let's see. And the water is free. Well, like the water you have to have. Well, it's, it's if the water's free. The water's a zero level spell, so the water is you can have as much as you want. Create water. You can okay. create enough food and water to sustain three humans or one horse per level for twenty four hours. So here's the thing about the water: what are you going to capture it? In? You're going to have to capture it. You can't just dump water in the ground and suck it out of the sand. It's not something you guys have to have an answer for right now, but it does have to, it is something that you have to answer for. That needs to be answer. like, we'll have to have like a small barrel, you know, that we, that we can create water above, let it dump, and then we transfer it to uh, wineskins. So here's the other problem with that is if you guys have a couple, uh, you know, a couple of three burrows or something like that, that are, that are trans, you know, that are trans, um, transporting like a barrel, a, wi a water barrel. Right. That's going to keep you guys from being super stealthy. Uh, even worse right. would be like if you had a wagon um, and you're like trundling across the world wound, like saying with a big sign that says not Crusader gorillas on it. <laughs> um, you know, I, you know, that's, I, this is, this is a, these are questions that need to be sort of addressed. Hey man, have it's cross mortar. We can do this. <laughs> Yeah, you know what they, you know, maybe you guys should load up on lembus bread. Ooh, let's see what we have to eat. Ooh, lembus mm. bread. And let's look. Lembus More bread. lembus bread. More mm. lembus bread. <laughs> yeah. All right, but before that happens, something else happens on day six. In the dark, in the distance, you hear you you hear the dwarves before you see them. In the distance on the plateau as they, as they move west towards Citadel Dres, and you can hear the sounds of them marching. Boom, boom, boom. Big drums, that kind of stuff as they, as they approach. And soon they, you know, but pretty soon they come into, in, they come into view. And it is a 500 strong uh, uh, cadre of heavy armored dwarven infantry. These guys are walking on you know, hammers, axes, shields, walking along, boom, boom, boom. We all of them wearing the the colors of General Harlekar and uh, um, and his um, and his crew. Now you you know a little bit about General Harlekar. Uh, he is a dwarven crusader. He has led a large crusader army for a long time. Um, he is uh, not to be trifled with. Um, uh, he has won some pretty significant victories. He is a key guy in Queen Galfrey's military forces. The fact that he's here means that he has probably, the way you interpret this is that he has broken out of Queen Galfrey's immediate forces to come to Dresden because of its, because of its history as a dwarven citadel. And he has come here because he's, you know, he's reclaiming it for the dwarves, essentially. Yeah, after we get it for him, he's claiming. <laughs> um, typical dwarves. Mm. So you hear their horns, you hear their footsteps in the distance, and soon they are at the doors of Citadel Drazen. Um, they are, by any stretch of the imagination, a formidable fighting force. Um, uh, and uh, you can see uh, them sort of rotate. And they are purely infantry, no cavalry of any kind. Um, there are wagons uh, that they are bringing supplies for their uh, crews in, but they are actually pulled by dwarves uh, who are pulling these sort of small, uh, small carts, which are piled high with uh, various kinds of supplies and stuff for the, for the thing. And they're, um, you know, in various ranks and stuff like that. Um, Harlekar comes in uh, and, you know, they, they sort of, they walk to the gates of Citadel Drazen and then um, almost, you know, there's this, there's this period of quietness. 
you know, where everybody's sort of looking at each other. And so then some of Irabet's guys start cheering like, Rah! you know, the dwarves are here. And then all of a sudden the dwarves are like, yes, we're here. They come running in and you can see that suddenly, you know, a lot, it looks like a lot of the crusaders that came with Irabet know a lot of these dwarven guys because, you know, they're, they're welcomed warmly. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's uh, high fives and hugs and, uh, uh, you know, a little bit of Indian leg wrestling, and, you know, um, they seem to be, uh, like, pretty soon a small cadre of dwarves, about eight guys, comes stomping up, uh, and Irabet comes out to meet them, and she's standing with you guys, and, um, hold on a second. If we're outside, I'm all cloaked up. And I'll just, let me show you a picture of this guy. So here are several of the guys. You can see over here is Geyer, uh, Irabet next to him. Um, and then this guy, this fella here is General Harlekar. He's an older dwarf. You can see highly armored, huge, uh, um, huge, like, I guess that's a war hammer of some kind that he thinks. But um, he comes up and uh, he goes up to Irabet and Irabet is like, Harlekar, it's good to see you. And uh, the general says, Irabet, good to see you too. And then he just sort of like hands his, hands his hammer off and he comes running up to Irabet and they, he gives her a big hug. Oh, oh, it's good to see you. Uh, and, and just like, you know, shakes her. And you can see that she's like, oh my God, this guy's squeezing the life out of me. And he's like, she's like, put me down, Harlekar, you big idiot. And, uh, you know, but they obviously know each other from and are, are friendly. And so he comes around to all of you and basically... You know, he comes to, you know, whoever's in line and gives everybody, you know, he grab, you know, big dwarven handshakes and hugs and, um, uh, you know, even Fletcher and Farina, you know, the elves are are uh, not known to be super friends with the dwarves. But even then he says things like, uh, you know, your, your service to the dwarves in this regard will not be forgotten. I will remember your names. Thank you so much. And he'll, you know, he, you know, he he actually is quite courtly. And, and Farina, for you, he'll actually kneel, you know, sort of bend down a little bit, takes your hand and kisses your hand, uh, and you know, pats it and is like, you know, thank you for everything. Even though he's got one eye on Otto, because uh, <clears throat> he's a little worried about that. But very warm, uh, very gregarious, uh, and uh, obviously quite tough. He's like, um, let's talk inside, shall we? And, uh, and sort of just like leads you guys into the Citadel like he owns the place. So you guys are back into that one same conference room. Everybody's there. Valentin's there. Geyer's there. Irabet's there. And so he, uh, he looks at uh, you guys and basically says, um, the dwarves of the Iron Hills, which, as we all know, transcends both space and time, <laughs> um, are in your debt forever for giving, delivering unto us a citadel that a, that a traitor took from us 70 years ago, plus or minus. We are in your debt, and that will never be forgotten. You are all friends of the dwarves from here on out, and friends of me personally. Um, my men, my 500 fighters here, have come to, to take the fight to the demons from this place. We will use the citadel as our base. Is now, again, a dwarven citadel. We will make it, we will, re, we will remake it in the image of all the old dwarven sky citadels of old. And a doughty fortress, a place of, of, of safety and a place from which the dwarves can, can march out and defeat all those who would stand against us. And he's banging on the table, he's like, there will be no rest until this citadel is back to the, the way it should be under the dwarven commands of old. My men will see to it. And Irabet is kind of like, all right, just chill, dude. It's going to be fun. Um, but he, he's, he's really sort of like, this is, this is we're, we're taking the fight to them now. So after uh, a few minutes of this, he says, all right, then. You have something for me, yes? And he gets a big smile. You have something for me, yes? A present for me? Yes. Fletcher, is this where you ask him to have all the stuff in the tomb? You know, I don't know anything about what, you know, present, but... Where he is he? Where is my old enemy? Didn't Dan want to take all that stuff? Bring him to me. Bring him to me. I want to see his face. I know he is. We <laughs> have his face. 
We have the face. But off. What do you mean? We have the I, face. <laughs> I assume it is on attached to the rest of him, yes. It it's is. Attached to his head. And I really did try not to kill him, sir. Did did you? You tried not, not to my kill good him. skills. <laughs> you tried. I asked one thing! One thing from you! Bring me vain, and you killed him on accident. Now what am I going to do? Well, you can either uh, raise him yourself or uh, live How about with you raise him yourself? <laughs> <laughs> We're happy to. You got a 10,000. Do I look like I'm carrying a bag diamond. of gold dust, of diamond dust that I want to waste on a creature like Vane? Is that what it looks like? So uh, we're in agreement. He's just dead. <laughs> then you see, so at that point, so um, uh, Harlekar has like his like advisors. There's like four or five of them. And they're all dwarves and they're all pretty tough looking. But one of them who's sort of like not as big a dwarf. I mean, a lot of them are, you know how dwarves are. They're all pretty meaty. And this guy's pretty meaty too, but he's not, he's not like huge. He's not like bomber size. Um, he kind of like, he kind of like leans over and he's sitting, he's sitting right next to Harlekar and you see him sort of whisper something into his, into his ear and Harlekar, well, you know, at first Harlekar is like, and then he's like, you know, he seems like, what, what, what was that? What, what, what? And you, he says, you know, and they're, then they're whispering something back and forth and Harlekar sort of like, he's like, okay, okay. Do you have his body? Yes. Is it intact? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, let me, so just, Why yes, do you guys? Yeah. I don't think we never took his head off. Some people have talked about him not having his head. I don't remember that happening. Oh, we we never, never, that's what I was going to ask we next. Did you guys actually we, chop off his head? We did not chop off his head. We did not chop off his head. Did you chop off any pieces of it? It's it's all one piece then. Yes, yeah. his body is we were, intact. We were yeah. concerned he was going to somehow raise himself, so we, we bound him hand and foot and gagged him, just in case he somehow came back to the other side. Right. <laughs> that was smart. That was we a smart that, move. We did that before. Now, we I have him. one further question. Do you have his armor? It would have been dark colored with spikes. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> lean in. You mean funny. like... <laughs> We didn't see any armor. Well, he was naked when we fought him, we promise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the paladin's wearing it. Yeah, I'm wearing it. I don't think you're wearing it, are you? No, you shouldn't. Yeah, yeah I am wearing it. Yeah, he, is wearing it. it. he is wearing it. <laughs> yeah, he is wearing it. Oh, because on the flat card, I zazzed it up a little bit. About that. About that. Yeah. Really? You're wearing uh, Vane's armor? We had this conversation. Absolutely. There's all the spiky stuff on it. Yeah, he put that armor on. Yeah, it was magical. We determined the properties. And evil. And, well, he detected evil. And he not said it was evil. Yeah. Because he specifically like soul share. We specifically asked if it was evil. Well, no, was soul share detect, detected his evil and tried to lie his way out of it. The armor did not detect his evil. Okay. So that's so that's uh, why we put on him. So uh, so Harlekar will. Is yeah, that, he wouldn't ask that question because he's he's staring right at the armor. Well, he doesn't know what it looks like. So he's like, it would have been dark and spiky, and then he sort of looks over kind of like at, yours. at Flash Art. He's like, is that his armor? Yeah. But but I'm a Paladin of Ioma Day, so I've bedazzled this a little bit since. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he he, 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 he shines it up a little bit, like a, little, yeah, put, a few like ribbons and you know pretty bows <laughs> and that kind of thing. I put I put like a unicorn uh, with with uh, sequins on the back. There's like a, a five year old painting of Ioma Day symbol on the front of it. Yeah, yeah. It's, like, it's like done in, it's like done in crayon. It's like a yeah. sword that just. It's just like a cross with a circle on it, you know. <laughs> is that his armor? Is that Vane's armor yeah. that you're wearing? Yeah. He raises an eyebrow. Is it? Do you mind if we borrow it for a moment? Perhaps a day or two? May I ask why? And so this, uh, this guy... Uh, so sitting next to Harlekar, who the guy who was whispering to him, sort of speaks up and he says, um, "Our intelligence suggests that uh, Vane um, had access to a, a, a philosopher's stone, and because of that, he was able to create elixirs of life. Um, 
Further, our, our intelligence suggests that he infused this elixir of life into the armor. The idea being that if he was slain in the armor, that if it, was, uh, if it wasn't removed from him immediately over the course of some period of time, which we do not know, that the elixir of life would seep into his body and revive his body would revive him. This was uh, uh, considered to be his sort of last ditch um, uh, insurance policy against his, against his masters upon Odysseus. Well, apparently he didn't anticipate his killers would be thieves. So So Harlekar would say, I don't think he anticipated being killed at all. He wasn't a warrior. He wasn't a fighter. He was a traitor and a coward. I imagined he expected that death would find him at his desk. As he, yes, as he, he, did. As he as his pen scrabbled, scribbled on parchments, and he sent others, better men, to his to their deaths. Sounds That's about right. It. So, my good friend, my new friend, Flashart, liberator of Drazen, and someone who has done me a personal favor of once. Let me ask of you one. Further favor, allow me to borrow this armor. Allow me to, to put it back on Staunton Vane's dead body and see if this elixir of life will bring him back so that he may stand trial with us. So that he may stand for adjudication in the dwarven tradition. I, I'll do a quick consult with the pup, the pup, the, the pup here. I'm going to agree to this uh, because we wanted to Staunton Vane alive anyway and we didn't, this is a bonus uh, thing that Armour had I didn't even know about. And if it, uh, and as long as he, they put a guarantee, the doors put a guarantee that, uh, that uh, he doesn't live to cause more mischief in the Citadel, then um, I don't have a problem with that. Okay, if you're talking, with, that, if you're talking with us without the dwarves around, yeah, yeah, are okay. extremely practical and going to say, if that's imbued on the armor, then that gives you a free death, which I'm all about. <laughs> <laughs> just saying well does does this happen every time he dies or do we have to recharge it or something like that one or? shot one shot yeah. deal one so shot yeah but there's only one guy who can redo it uh, he's dead currently <laughs> we can ask but him i'm just saying if if this is imbued on the armor and we're in a fight and you get killed because you're on the front line um we leave you in that armor for a day and then you come back to fight again with us that's one way to look at it. The rest of, what does the rest of the party say? And just, like I said, Illandar is very practical. Just to play the other side of it, um, we're also at, at some point hoping to ask the dwarves to be allowed to loot a dwarven tomb. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it, good call. It might be nice to be their friends when that happens because my diplomacy check is only going to be so high. So, yeah. so we'll point. ask that now in exchange for the armor. Uh, uh, that's not diplomacy. That's <laughs> mafia-style diplomacy. <laughs> what am I saying? Sorry, I'm not lawful good. <laughs> wait, uh, if I, if I, if I, if, let me review Twitter real quick. Oh, yeah, wait, it does say that about mafia-style diplomacy. Hold on a second. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, if you withhold the armor for that, it, it does, would be a shame. If you make it part of the same deal, it's a negotiation, not a demand. No, it, it, the, if, it would be a shame if anything happens to your family is not negotiation. Here's a quote. Am I the only one who thinks that this party got its training in diplomacy from the Mafia cleric A team? Ah, that is weird. We did. Yes, because their diplomacy was do what we ask you to do or we're going to rip your face off. Now, maybe we can interest you in like a protection coverage, uh, you know, for your citadel here because we need, need something bad to happen to it. Um, <laughs> Uh, what about Karina? <laughs> the the FUP her. giveth and the FUP taketh away. It's a nice yeah. citadel you got here, Dwarpo. My suggestion <laughs> something be, happened to it. My suggestion would be to cooperate without asking anything for it. And then later I will ask to speak to the leader alone and address the possible or the possibility of getting the magic items out of that tomb. Okay. Anybody else? I, 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 I think we want these dwarves on our side. I, yeah, I, I like what Mike says, and I would love to see if we can somehow duplicate that for some future ability. But let's uh, let's see. That was an unknown cool thing this did, but let's see what uh, what benefits this pays for us to to bring back uh, the one thing we failed in our mission originally. Otherwise, it was a smashing success. All yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm good with that. Good. Ilandar's just I, pointing out, like I said, he's a very practical. 
he's kind of had to be practical since he's been on the surface and, you know, surviving among people who want him dead. So that's the way he gonna, And now he doesn't have Bardos looking out for him either. Yeah, uh-huh. I imagine so, uh, Keister's feeling a little hot. Flashheart's going to jump out of the armor and uh, send it off to the dwarves, and then I'll spend time looking at my feet and figuring out how to use my mount and whatnot. <laughs> as, as, uh, and the dwarf is like... Well, Lord Flashheart, I must say, I, I've never met a paladin who uh, did not wear anything under his armor. Yeah, I am with the assistant say. commando. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm one of her commandos. Again, I'm, I'm impressed. Her, I'm I'm saying, why do you think we made him put the armor on? <laughs> <laughs> do you not find it to be a bit chafing? <laughs> yeah, you know, I just... Uh, a, Perhaps a, a little petroleum jelly. Like, yeah, a cure light wound every uh, every few turns. I'm good <laughs> to keep for to keep the rashes off. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, so you, I mean, do you say to him like, I, I, you know, of course we will give this to you. Uh, we are the friends of the dwarves. You are our friends, and we will. And we'll give, do you say something like that? I, I, along with the conditional guarantee that that uh, you know. It's, that they make sure that Mason Vane does not make, cast any mischief or sow any mischief amongst the, the. I don't think he can, but especially with the Temple Guardian or the Citadel Guardian back and whatnot. But just just be extra careful bringing him back. This dude's a slippery fish. Oh, I guarantee you, my friend. Staunton Vane will never commit any any atrocity amongst these halls again. Not if the dwarves have anything to say about it. <clears throat> so he he brings some service. They grab up the armor, and you guys cough up. Sta- I mean, you cough up Staunton's body. Hey, uh, <laughs> I, I just real quick, just before I turn this over, I do a little uh, subtle uh, detect evil on this guy, <laughs> just just to make sure I'm not. On who Harlekar? Yeah, just you know a subtle one, just uh, making sure that Harlekar has been turned by a demon on his march over here that I'm about to hand him their their <laughs> okay. buddy. All right, that's that's legit. Um, no, Harlekar is not evil. Harlekar is lawful okay. good. And right, double check, uh, double checking. But well, well, he does, he does say that it's it's he if he looks evil, it's because um something's tricking. It's some other <laughs> magic. <laughs> um, He's like, I know I look evil. So, so we should take him to the hall and have him talk to the uh, planetar. <laughs> yeah. Who's gone back yeah. into the uh, the planetar? Has gone back into the right, planetar. right. So, uh, all right, so you guys fetch uh, Vane's body. Where, where did you guys have stowed Vane's body? I was carrying it. So you're just lugging it around for the last couple of days? I'm going to assume you put him in some sort of convenient storage place that was out away from the kitchens. Sure. Um, uh, yeah. Just, you know, because frankly, lugging a dead body around is probably, especially a dwarven body. You're an elf and you're pretty strong, but I mean, this guy probably weighs 220 pounds. Um, that doesn't know. even fill me up to my first knot. Although, that would be one heck of a conversation starter. Can you imagine just coming up to the mess hall and like slamming the body down <laughs> as you sit down to eat? <laughs> that would like start a conversation. Like, I'll take a shot of Mad Dog Red, please. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the bartender looks over at Vane and goes, you got anything smaller than that? I can't change that. Um, I'm, I'm I'm channeling an old uh, an old uh, uh, wormy cartoon. Um, <laughs> all right, so uh, you guys, uh, Fletcher, you go and get the body of um, of uh, Staunton Bay, and the other dwarves sort of wrap him in his armor, get it all strapped up, and they say, and you know, and then Harlequin's like, now we wait, you know, that kind of thing. And so uh, it does actually take. Um, about 12 hours but um you and, and you guys don't watch it the whole time you guys are off of the thing and you you're talking with harlekar you're talking with irabet about various kinds of things at harlekar actually Har- yeah around. walking around mm-hmm. showing the stuff that needs repair you know harlekar is like this guy he's like you know he's got his guys behind him and he's like remember we need to fix those battlements that that ballista has a bad string you know that kind of thing and he's giving orders and these guys are like running off and at you some know, point at some but, point during all of this uh-huh. I'd like to ask Harlekar if I can have a minute, of a minute of his time alone. Ah, my good friend Lothar. Yes, of course. Uh, is this a public conversation or a private conversation that you wish? A private conversation. Of course. Uh, he's like, gentlemen, off with you. Uh, and you have, you have work to do. Go on. And uh, he walks. Mm-hmm. Uh, you guys are outside, maybe in the Bailey somewhere, and he walks off with you. And uh, you know, Now then, Lothar, priest of Arasta, my new friend. 
what can I do for you? This I'll is tell him lip and tentacles shoot out and wrap him around and, his head. Wrap around his face, exactly. <laughs> like I'll, the thing. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell him that to the southwest of here is the tomb of Torag, Lord of the Dwarves. We discovered it being inhabited by a, a filthy undead. We were able to destroy that creature and reconsecrate the tomb. Oh, I am in your debt. I, my personally, am a follower of Torag. Uh, However, it's been... During, during this, this time, uh, I spoke to Harilga. I assume you know who she is. Uh, Harlekar might, but your DM has forgotten. She's, <laughs> she's, she's the bear servant of Torag. Ah, oh, right, yes. She's the one that gave me the, the blessing. Yes. I spoke with her. There are items that are in his tomb. That, and is, a great, normal... that is a great blessing that you've, you've had. And under normal circumstances, I would under no, I wouldn't uh, dream of. Yeah, I wouldn't dream of of taking things from a tomb, and we have not. However, there are items in there that could help the Crusaders, especially the people in my party, to continue the fight against evil. Hmm. So my question, based on where we are now, is: Would the dwarves allow those items to be taken and used for the current battle, uh, and? We can leave Torag in his rest. And then, return, and then return when we're done. And then return them when we've completed, uh, hopefully, the mission of closing How the about war. returned upon death? You know, when if we people. pass on. <laughs> if we die, you guys can come and get them. <laughs> yeah, we'll put them at this level, by the time we reach 15th level, they're going to be kind of mundane. Right, exactly. Uh, so at some, point, at some point, they'll no longer be as useful to us, and we can return them. This is not what I'm telling him, just as out of character, but... Tell me, but tell me, tell me one thing. Yes. What did the what did the great bear of Torag tell you? What did he say to you? Um, he said, "Yo, new spirit, who this?" Uh, Hang on. Here, <laughs> take this stuff. Oh wait, nope. <laughs> wait, wait. You she remember? Introduced, she introduced herself, and that her lord bid me bestow upon uh, that her lord bid her to bestow upon me his blessings and his intelligence. In thanks for returning his tomb to consecrated ground. And if you ever see Goldilocks, slay her. Turns, Harlekar turns around and he grabs you by the by the lapels. He says, "This is such a glorious blessing, and I know that it is Torag speaking through you and a Rastilian to me, a follower of Torag my whole life. The fact that the great she bear spoke to you tells me that you are blessed not only of Eresta, but of Torag as well." Take what you wish from the tomb. Use it in good health. Use it to fight our enemies. Return it when you will. And I'll bow to him and thank him. Stand up, Ulfin man. And he gives you a big bear hug. He's like, ha, 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 ha. You and I are brothers under Torag. You may not know it, but you still worship Razdol, who is known to Torag and our friends. But I suspect that someday you will find yourself with an with a with a with a uh, idol of Arastal and an idol of Torag in your citadel, I quote you now. You remember these words? <laughs> yes, and under my breath, and no spells. <laughs> no spells. <laughs> Warriors like us do not need spells. <laughs> so he's like, yeah, absolutely. Take what you will. Um, it is yours. Nice work, Lothar. All right, so we will figure out what that stuff was. Yeah, that's kind of way back there, but there was a, I think there was armor, a helm, and a weapon, I believe. But I believe that's correct, but I will have to go through my notes as soon as I, I find a fucking pencil. Here we go. I didn't um, actually write that down. I just pulled up the email from when I had the conversation. It made it easier. Okay. <laughs> uh, forward me that email in case I still don't have it. Okie dokie. And I will send you uh, information on that. Uh, all right, so you guys, you know, hanging out, you know, doing a variety of things. And about 12 hours later, uh, a dwarf comes running up to Harlekar. Harlekar won't let you guys alone. He's basically like, come with me. I'll, I'll, help me inspect the battlements. You know, and he's like, he's, he won't leave you guys alone. I mean, he's like, uh, Flashheart, where are you going? Uh, well, are you off for a piss now? I mean, I think, hurry back. We've got work to do. <laughs> and uh, Irabet's just like, oh, my God. He's, in, in, you know. Um, at one, at one point, Ilandara goes to Irabet and is like, is he always like this? And she's like, 
he's always like this um every time i've known him so he is just like a, a hugely jovial dude but um pretty soon a couple of his guys come running up and say vane has returned and he's like ah yes so come let's go and so uh you go inside and you about yeah, we're, we're all going over this you guys yeah are, I, let, I want to be there <laughs> you guys are actually outside uh, in the Bailey, when you know approaching the gates of the Citadel, when out comes like it's got to be a dozen dwarves, and they've got uh, Staunton Vane, who is back, and he's he, he looks he looks uh, haunted. His skin is sallow, his eyes are sunk, and this is a guy who's been dead for several days. He has walked amongst his peers in the abyss, and now he's back to face whatever it is. And, um, you know, they, uh, they, you know, you let outside uh, into the thing and, uh, you know, <laughs> the dwarves are gathering around and they're jeering at him. They're spitting at him. Uh, they're throwing rotten food at him. And finally, they bring him in front of Harlecar and he's like, spread out, boys. Um, and they bring him in front of Harlecar and he's like, <laughs> vain, finally. And Vane is just, you know, Staunton is just looking. He's looking at him. At first he looks at Harlecar, then he looks at you guys, and he's like, uh, you know, he doesn't say anything, but the, the hate in his eyes. And uh, he's, you know, Harlecar grabs his, his hammer, and he's like, boom, boom, into the dirt. And he says, let your adjudication begin, Staunton Vane. You are charged with murder, treachery, desertion, Perfidy, espionage, heresy, black guardery, being a colossal shit, and many other crimes too numerous to mention here. Your own journal serves as your confession and a catalog of your deeds. How do you respond, you honorless piece of pig shit? And everybody's cheering, the other dwarves are like, oh, cheering and all that kind of stuff. But Vane is silent. He glares at everybody's divine. And finally, uh, you, you see Harlecar is like, shut up, we want to hear what he says. And Vane says in a, in a quiet voice, he's like, I deny nothing. I did it all. And I invoke the challenge. At which point, the dwarves erupt like it is a British soccer game. It's like cheers <laughs> and cheers. They're throwing stuff. And you hear, before, before anybody can say anything else, you hear Harlecar said, accepted! And uh, uh, he's like, and everybody's like screaming. And they're like, bring him outside. And they, um, you know, they bring him out into the Bailey. And they, you know, basically, f and you think that every single one of these dwarves is in a giant circle around. They form a big circle. And you guys are on the, on the inside edge. You get to see everything. But everyone is here. Everybody comes out. And they basically form like a big circle of about, uh, oh, maybe 50 feet in diameter. Harlecar is there and he's got his hammer in his hand and he's just like Kong Kong, you know, and you've seen that hammer of Harlecar. It's enormous. And somebody's like, he, he looks over, and he says, someone give him a weapon. And uh, Vane, Vane kind of looks around and uh, holds his hand out. And somebody I, I grab, I grab my smallest dagger and walk <laughs> over and give it to him. <laughs> I can just say, here's what you do. Yeah. You know, this is what, you know, somebody, you know, <laughs> Illidar leans over and he's like, here you go, Stan. <laughs> You know, uh, no, somebody hands him a battle axe, and he's like, okay, now now it's like, and these guys, um, uh, 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 and suddenly uh, he's like, someone, begin the challenge, and you, and, and everybody goes quiet, and then you see one guy over in, over in the side, and he's got one of these dwarven horns, and he's just like, and all of a sudden, these guys go at it. And you see these guys fight. It goes back and forth. Harlecar's old, but he's obviously a fighter. But Vane is tough. Um, he's, uh, he's, he's agile. He's nimble. And he gets in a few licks. But finally, you, uh, you know, there's cheering and howling. It goes on probably for 10 minutes, these guys just trading blows back and forth. But Harlecar finally gets him and gives him and, and, and gives him a hit and knocks him to the ground and uh, um, and, he, and the, the the place goes berserk and uh, cheers and howling and that kind of stuff. The dwarves are going crazy and Harlecar you can see Vane is on the ground. His chest is kind of caved in. The armor's a little caved in and uh, you see you see Harlecar go over there and he's he's bleeding a little bit. He's got blood and he's got his hammer. And he goes, 
it ends here, Vane. And you can you can see, you, you know, Staunton Vane sort of coughs up a bunch of blood, sort of spits it out and goes, and he's laying flat on his back, and he goes, I'll see you in the abyss, Harlegar. And Harlegar goes, you will see me there. And he lifts up that hammer and just crushes his skull, pancakes it all over the thing, and the cheering goes wild. They come over, uh, they strip the body, throw a... Uh, uh, um, and uh, you see Harlekar, who stands back, and he's obviously, he's got a skin of wine in his hand that somebody's given him. And he goes, be careful with that armor. It belongs to him now. And he points at the, it points at Flash. Give it to him. It's his, it's his by, by right of, uh, by right of defeat. And, you know, people are like, well, he, you, he didn't defeat him. Harlekar defeated him. And you know, he's like, do as I say. And, he, you know, they give the armor back to you, Flash. Art. But uh, the I'll, rest of them I'll is bow, uh, I'll bow they, gratefully. They find they with they friends. basically find a like a garbage pit. They fill it with charcoal and garbage. They dump and one you know a couple of dwarves are like dump a bunch of you know like little kegs of naphtha in there and uh, and they just they you know you know one two three they throw his body into the pit uh, and somebody is uh, and somebody's like torch and Harlekar just grabs a torch they light it and he just chucks it in and whoo and it just burns like crazy and he's like. You know, he, uh, uh, he wipes off a, a bit of his uh, thing. Everybody's cheering. He wipes the blood off of him. He takes a bow. Um, and uh, you hear Harlekar say, let it all burn. And he's like, this is done. He comes, he comes back to you guys. Uh, and, you know, he gives, he gives Flashheart a big hug, goes just down the line, giving everybody a big hug. Although Ilandar is a drow, your hug is a little bit lighter, a little bit ginger, you know. And he's like, uh, <laughs> And, and it involves like a dagger in the back too, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then Harlekar looks to his collected guys and uh, he says, "Justice is served. Let us feast." And you uh, suddenly these guys suddenly those carts that came out these guys are rolling out. You know they're starting to cook entire pigs, sheep. They're you know they roll out keg after keg of ale that they brought with them. It's a huge outdoor barbecue blowout. And it is that it goes on all night long. It's a huge I'm party. I'm the party and so these guys are growing on me. Like you know, once Harlekar gets in his uh, gets in his uh, things, you know, and at one point while this is all happening, um, you remember the the uh, the assistant guy who who um, is did Gordon and Jennifer leave? Are they here still? No, they're here. Uh, Okay, so at one, at one point, I didn't see it, they were uh, outside of anything. So at one point, while this fight is going on, I mean, you guys are kind of like, well, this is the weirdest kind of like, uh, you know. Um, trial? Uh, court. Yeah, this is the weirdest tribunal <laughs> I've ever been at. And you remember the guy who whispered into uh, Harlekar's ear uh, and told him about, and told you guys about the, the fact that the armor had this stuff on him? He actually comes over to you uh, while the fight's going on and afterwards and says, look, um, I don't know, Gordon. What does he say? He explains the uh, the situation. The dwarves are much more into their own honor and what should be done rather than any kind of court of law or anything. So, fighting vain was something that had to be done in the in the dwarven uh, sense of honor. Yeah, it was a sense of honor. So. Uh, he just tries to explain to people who aren't dwarves why this would happen. Yeah, he goes on to talk about a little bit like it's you know that these 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 adjudications are not about guilt or innocence. You know, uh, vain. There was never any question that he was guilty. It was a matter of uh, this is like the final piece of recapturing Citadel Drazen for the dwarves. That, that Vane had to be killed by a dwarf. This was this was a huge part of what needed to be done. That's why Harlekar was was um, you know frankly uh, and the way the way this guy this the way this war would characterize it is that Harlekar was worried that they weren't going to be able to do this to Vane and and meet the requirements of their cultural precepts. Um, so it's good that you guys still had the, the, the that you guys still had the. Uh, armor and that you were able to bring it back and that's why everybody was like super happy with him and uh and flat out he'll tell you that you know you you've got a friend in harlekar probably for life now because you were able to, for him to allow him to fulfill this part of of his his you know sort of his you know the honorable retaking of, of citadel 
Every time you describe a, a fantasy party that we're at, I always think of the Empire, or the Return of the Jedi Ewok party at the end of the movie there. Uh, every <laughs> yeah, time. It's, like, it's mm-hmm. kind of like that, yeah. Um, <laughs> so this is the Eat Chub and Yub Nub section of the party? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Gordon, um, does this guy say anything else to them? Uh, I don't know. I think you kind of filled everything in. I don't have anything, right. I guess. So, uh, just to give you an idea what this guy looks like, um, uh, he, uh, he looks, he, he, he seems, for a dwarf, he, even during the party, he seems kind of serious, kind of focused. Um, unlike a lot of his fellows, he, he listens well. When you guys talk to him, I mean, you can see that he's paying attention. Um, he's about average size for a dwarf. He's got pretty good muscles. Obviously, he's been a, a, a fighter for a long time, but he's not He's not huge. Uh, he's got brown eyes, uh, brown hair that's braided along with a long beard uh, that's braided into many, uh, many tails. Um, he wears an armored headband that bears the hammer symbol of Torag. And, and uh, you, you can see that uh, underneath the tabard that he wears and his cloak of brown uh, that he's wearing some sort of chain mail or something like that. Um, Strange, you know, he has, uh, uh, like many of the dwarves that he's with, he has a gauntlet on his left hand and a buckler on his hand. Um, a lot of the guys wear this, uh, wear this kind of thing. But um, he also has a strange kind of hammer uh, that, uh, you know, he hasn't drawn or anything like that, but um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hammer of distinct dwarven make. Hammer of stink, would you say? Distinct. It's distinctly dwarven in manufacture. Okay. It's, it's not like it's not like a dwarf picked this up, and it, and it doesn't. It's it's a it's definitely a hammer designed for battle. Uh, in that it um you know it looks like the kind of hammer that might be really good against like cavalry or something. Although you're not sure. Well, well I will say well, it's hello, a little random in fighting from a distance. Yeah. I, I will say well, hello, random NPC. Uh, I used to, your description seems so much more thorough than normally I come across. Than, uh, <laughs> uh, well, there's something that's significant to you. What What is your name again? My name is Om. 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 Okay. Nice to meet you, Om. Hey, Les, in general, mm-hmm. um, being a drow, I'm mm-hmm. kind of not putting myself in the forefront of things. Are these dwarves treat me like I would expect? Or you mean like beating you into submission and trying to kill you? Pretty much, yeah. No, they're or actually so it, it becomes pretty, pretty great suspicion. It, it becomes pretty clear. I mean, initially there was a there was more than one set of raised eyebrows. Um, but you get the impression that at some point, so Harlecar has actually gone up to you specifically. He's gone up to everybody, uh, right. and either, uh, you know, very warmly shaking their hand or in some cases, you know, big hugs. Um, you got a handshake, but it was very much the idea and you, and you get the impression that it was, that not only was he, was he sort of expressing his, his thanks for what you have done. But he was also demonstrating to his people that uh, that that you, regardless of the fact that you were a dark elf, um, were now his friend, and that they should treat you know. So, and so I saw a difference once he done that. Once yeah, he the, that. yeah, absolutely. The unspoken okay. idea is that okay, he's Harlecar's friend. If we screw with this guy, um, we're gonna we're gonna get it in the ass. So. Um, Okay. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you don't have a ton of people coming up to you saying, "Hi, Drow, right. how's it going?" But um, you <laughs> certainly aren't getting, uh, uh, okay. you certainly aren't getting like attacked. Okay. Yeah, okay. they gotta take you pretty well in stride too, because you're hanging out with a ton of lawful good paladins that are everywhere. So they're like, eh. "What's the chance of the Drow got up here and didn't get noticed?" Consider yourself lucky for the handshake. I had to cast Cure Light after the hug. <laughs> <laughs> No one's ever after, no one's ever the same after a hug from Harlecar. Um, well, I right. guess I'm going to send my armor out to the cleaners after I did all the the all the stunt and vein goo as we go. Yeah, it's again. it's bloody, but uh, you know what? Uh, Harlecar will actually detail a couple of his guys to sort of get it cleaned up for you, and he's like, "It'll be in your rooms later." Um, nice. You know, uh, in the meantime, the feast begins. You know, let us party, and and uh, you know, so it's a pretty big blowout. Uh, 
you know, 500 dwarves uh, uh, partying after the, the murder of a, uh, a hated enemy. That's, 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 that's a, that's a blowout. Yep, yep. Everybody has a good time. Uh, and, uh, you know, the more ale that gets drunk, um, Mike, the more, the more dwarves come up to you and say, so you're a drow, eh? <laughs> uh, you know that kind of stuff. And what's it like coming from Menzel Brands? You know that kind of thing. Um, yeah, but no. they, uh, but they Eleanor, are. Actually, Eleanor would actually eat that stuff up, and he would be all about trying to. Uh, he would be friendly and and, you and know, try for, to talk to them about stuff. And you know, the first time one of them says, you know, I was one of the things I was going to say. The first time one of them says, the only good drow is a dead drow. Eleanor would agree with them pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it, you, you do, you do. Uh, um, they do. Uh, uh, seem to uh, there's a bit of um, mascot aspect to it, you know. After a while, these guys are like, "This is our drow," you know, that kind of thing. It's Illidar, yeah. and uh, of course, Storm is just like, "What the hell are you talking about?" Um, but uh, yeah, no, they do not. Uh, they don't attack. There are fights, uh, you know. There are a lot of you know, right. sort of the uh, several of the dwarves go at it with each other, you know, sort of an impromptu wrestling and. Um, you know, uh, the, you, you know, know the Indian leg wrestling you're talking about. Yeah, the Indian leg wrestling. You know, and you know that kind of stuff. But it's nothing. It's not like you know they're trying to kill each other. It's just you know, good natured dwarven fun. The next day, everyone is hung over to shit, and nobody nobody uh, comes out before ten, except for people who have been detailed. To, you know, early watch that kind of stuff. But uh, well, I try to especially appreciate the hangover. It's been a long uh, time coming. <laughs> About midday, um, you guys get a call. Uh, for you, you guys get actually sort of like uh, uh, um, a couple of crusaders come up and just like, excuse me, uh, there's somebody at the front gates that says that they know you um, from the supply line. And you're like, what? We deny everything. <laughs> and you go out there and it is none other then Horgus Gwerm. You remember him? <laughs> oh, my old buddy Gwerm. The dude that tried he has showed up with a huge supply system. train. Uh, yeah. He's brought food. He's brought supplies. He's brought equipment. Uh, he has a new cadre of servants and guards. Uh, and he, he greets you about as warmly as expected. Sort of like, ah, I can see. See, you did well here. Excellent. Uh, I'm very pleased. You know, Open that up new trade routes for you, Gwerm. Well, basically, that's what he tells you. He says, look, you know, so uh, Irabet talked to him. Basically, what he tells you is that his idea is to supply the Crusaders of Dresden and all along the river path from Canebras. He's rebuilt in Canebras. He has connections in both Mendev and Numeria who have been bringing him supplies. The supply lines are open. He has a deal with Queen Galfrey. And right now, he's the sole contractor supplying the needs of all outposts from Canebras to Dresden. This has been a huge financial opportunity for him. And he has not looked a thing. He's basically rebuilding his merchanting concern. And this is his first big deal. And so he just wanted to come in and he's like, um, he calls all you guys, all the people that he knew, uh, you know, from down underneath the, uh, when you guys were in the caves together, he calls y'all and he's like, I brought a little something special. And he brings out three bottles of this very pretty, I mean, here, incredibly rare cognac that he's like, I just want to, uh, just, just, I knew I was going to run into you and I wanted to say, uh, you know, thank you for all that you've done for me. Um, you know, bringing me out of those caves and everything and uh, allowing me to, to get, get back on, on my feet. Uh, I've really started to create something here and I got to say, it's, it's really been quite, uh, quite heartening. You know, uh, an old merchant of my age, you know, you, uh, you find yourself in, uh, in, in, uh, in um, you know, wealth and prosperity and comfort and uh, you forget those, uh, those early days when you're trying to build a business and cutting deals. And I had forgotten that. And, uh, you know, despite the fact that, you know, Canebris was in ruins, we were, I, you know, I was able to, through your help, I was able to sort of come back and restart those old things, the things that I really enjoyed, building a business from the ground up, making those contacts and providing those things that, uh, the comforts and creature comforts that are always there. So I brought you these gifts. Please, let's share some cognac and, uh, and, and that kind of stuff. He's also brought a variety of cheeses and, and meats and, uh, you know, uh, fresh, you know, uh, he's like, fresh, look, squeeze it. It's fresh bread from Mendev that he's put together. He's basically put together a huge care package for you guys. 
uh, and you have an, another feast all your own in the room. He's got eggs. Which, which considering we've been on the road for the last month or so. Oh, yeah. Probably like even doubly amazing. Now, at first, after the previous night's debauch, you guys, you know, you, I mean, you're just taking little tiny sips of the cognac. But, you know, over time, you have a little hair of the dog. It starts to be like, uh, you know, well, maybe fill those glasses up a little longer. You know, and, and Guerm is telling you about all these kinds of things. But, yeah, basically, he and Irabet have a deal. He's made deals with Queen Galfrey, and he is going to be supplying the entire supply line. His, uh, his merchanting concern is basically the sole provider of, of supplies. Um, and he's come in, he's got food, he's got equipment and supplies. Basically what this does from a game standpoint is um, you can, you, you have a market to whom you can sell uh, loot and over time it will grow to the, to where you can buy certain things as well. Right now you can get mundane equipment. Uh, over time you'll be able to get, uh, you know, magical you know, things like potions and stuff like that. You'll be able to get, be able to acquire from them. Nice. Not today, but over time. There's no tunnel home. There's no tunnel home, but uh, um, you know you're kind of kind of out, out, out in the field. So um, he's the best you got right now. But so he if does. We come by and he's got an exclamation point above his head. We'll know that it's time to. He's got a quest. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but I mean, you guys know. Yeah, I mean, basically, you're you're in a position where you know the guy who supplies the town. So if you have requests and can get a message to him back in Canebris, you can mm. find it on the next supply train. Nice. All right. Hold All right. that thought. I'll be right back. I gotta get a See you in about a, a, a rock. See you in about a rock. Hey, what do you guys feel about pooling together money to get a magic item for Lothar? An eleven thousand gold piece magic item. Why is this? Sure. What, what's he gonna get? What's he gonna do? It's a phylactery that basically adds 2d6 to his bursts. So every burst he does, instead of doing like right now, it's... 46. It's 46, it would become 66. I'm not sure that's a good ROI, you know? We, we so how much, all do we, how much <laughs> do we all need to chip in? With the size of this party, everybody about 1,500 to two grand. How much money do we have like laying around? I don't think I've spent a dime in this campaign so far. Yeah, we haven't had anything to spend money on. Yeah, we haven't really, yeah, we started with nothing and haven't really been in a functional city or whatever to. Were you about to say we started at the bottom and now we're here? So, <laughs> so which, is, we, which is a much higher. Party, we have a party treasury. I've got some stuff. Hang on. Okay. All right. Yes, so, hey, what? any I'll, questions I'll, I'll, for Glarm? I'll bring this up in an email after this. Okay. Is that, am I, am I going to be copied on that? No. no. Well, based on what you just said, if we need something, we can send an order to him. Yeah. Based, based on this email chain, I'm, we might have a request for him, but I don't well, know. Well, keep yet. in mind you're on the frontier. Even Canaveras is on the frontier, but um, right. you know, within right. reason, yeah, absolutely. Well, something that, yeah, we wouldn't need immediately, but... Whenever we can get around to it. You know, or, some, something, you know, I mean, you might think of it. Um, do you have any wizards? We, we lost do. ours. The only wizard you have? I was thinking scrolls. So um, if you were to tell Guerm that the next time he comes up from Canebras, if he could bring parchment, quills, magical writing ink, that kind of stuff, uh, so that you could scribe scrolls at Citadel Drazen, because they don't have that stuff here now. Um, you wouldn't be able to scribe a scroll at Citadel Drazen. But if you tell him, you know, we, we've got some money, we can give it to you, uh, bring this stuff up, he'll, yeah, the next, the next time he comes up, you know, from then on, you'll be able to scribe scrolls. It works that way. Same with potions. I mean, if you were to say, look, we want to commission an alchemical laboratory so that we can make potions, if somebody has craft potion, um, you can't do it now, but Guerm could bring that stuff, you know, as a special request. And then from then on, you could you could do that. Right. And Mike, yep. to aside, except for the starting money that I had, uh, and maybe from our first set of adventures in the caves, only money I have written down on my uh, my my gear is uh, two bags of five hundred gold piece worth of gems from Horgus, which is this guy right here. When we, uh, right. when we yeah, all of us should have that. Yeah, all of us should have that separate. And then I've got a running total of what I've kept. For, it says party booty. Um, there's a few items in here. Most of them been handed out, but we sold some of them back in in Canaveras when we're back there. But we're up to I don't know f around four grand. So not a ton, but 
Start. It's a start. Each of us is up to a four grand, or that's no, no, no. The that's the total. That's the party. And what's yeah. the splattery going to run? Eleven grand. Hmm. Can't get it yet, anyway. But uh, yeah. I mean, we placed the order, and then yeah. by the time we got back after some adventuring, we should be good to go. Will be a GOD. Is that gonna, the order with gold on demand, on delivery, gold on delivery? Yeah, COD. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be yeah. G-O-D, gold on demand. Yeah, G-O-D. Or on delivery, that's what it'd be. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do an email with this after this. Okay. By All the right. time I get the money, he'll be up to 5D6 or 6D6 on his which own. Would, which would still be doing two more. Yeah. Since he's our only healer. Yeah, that's uh, Wait, what are you guys talking about? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> for the Magi. Yeah. We want, a staff, we, we want staff of powers for the entire party. You know there's more of those staffs of power? Can any of us write scrolls? I don't know. We think we're, we think we're we think we're back. Bardos. Uh, yeah, I think Bardos could. <laughs> I, I think Bardos could, but we need to go and find him. Well, yeah. I think he might be MIA yeah. permanently now. And yeah. meeting this uh, this random dwarf here gives me uh, disheartens me that uh, we may never find by that. <laughs> wait, 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 wait! Somebody take the leadership feat and get a magic. Oh, Bill, <laughs> oh, I leadership. totally would. So I banned two things in this game: leadership feat and guns. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> no leadership feat. We're not having cohorts. You're not going to have shitloads of NPCs following you around like a bunch of little ninnies. Okay, never mind that. If you, oh, if you try to do that, I will, kill, I will murder them with extreme prejudice by every every chance I get. Wait, that's what, I, that's what I took with this new level. You didn't say that before. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was told you to take that and you know, I was going to have uh, Sir Robin's bards following you around. You know, up our party. <laughs> Robin. <laughs> he chickened out. He ran away. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, so in case you guys want to get a look at the, what this ohm guy looks like, that's him on the bottom there. It looks, it, it's a battle there. That's uh, the right pick, right, Gordon? Or did I pick the wrong one? That's right. That's yeah, the right guy. Yeah. Okay, so he's a little rough and ready, uh, but seems uh, quite genteel and educated. Uh, um, oh, yeah, he looks genteel. Remaining, uh, remaining quite dangerous. Um, so the next day after Horgus, so Horgus is going to be in, in, in Dresden for a couple of days while he sorts things out here. In the meantime, you guys, the next day you guys get approached by none other than, you guys remember Quednus Orlin? The old guy who works for Irabet as her uh, sort of, uh, sort of um, court sage. You know, he was the guy who explained to you about the Wardstones and what the Nihydri, mm -hmm. what, the, what they were trying to do to the Nihydri crystals and Canebras. So basically, he comes to you. He showed up with Irabet. You, has, you haven't seen him for days. But basically, he comes to you and he says, look, I have some information that I want to give you. We've been doing some investigations. I thought there's some information that I want to give you uh, that might be valuable to you going forward. I don't know for sure, but, um, but I want to give it to you. So a couple of things. First, he examined the Nahydrian crystals, the large crystals in the room where the shadow demon was. Those were not, and Farina, you you actually perk up when you hear this because you were like, what? those were those were the ones I tried to destroy. They were not Nihydrian crystals, but they were very reminiscent of them. Uh, one would say like low quality, like cubic zirconia versus a diamond. Uh, yeah. Low quality, but a similar make. Uh, so Nihydrian, Nihydrian crystals are much smaller than what you saw in that room, but they carry a great deal more magical power. Uh, after examining the bodies of the Chimera, um, and uh, there was another creature that I don't have written down that also had some of this with it. He found evidence of concentrated Nihahydrian crystal. Uh, and basically what he says to you is someone has processed these into some sort of serum that can augment demonic abilities if it doesn't kill the subject outright. Uh, it's very powerful, very dangerous stuff. It's not like enhancing a crystal itself. It's a, some sort of serum. Someone or something is processing these Nihydrian crystals into Nihydrian serum. It's not taking place here. We, we, uh, we searched everywhere. It would require a significant laboratory, which we do not have. 
and someone's doing this. The crystals you saw were not those, but if, once we examine the bodies of the chimera, um, we realize that that this is this, somebody is somebody is distilling these crystals into some sort of liquid that they are they are giving to creatures in an attempt to augment their abilities. I'm gonna, now, ask, I'm gonna ask if he has an idea on how you might negate the effects of the serum they're creating. If he's thought about uh, it. God, negate it? No idea. I, you know, honestly, if this is if this serum is applied to a creature or given to a creature along with the appropriate spells, we, once it's done, it's done. I mean, you give if you if you were to give this serum to some sort of creature, apply the appropriate spells, either one or two things would happen. Eight times out of ten, it would just kill them uh, because of the power of this of this magic and the serum itself. These nihydrian crystals. The other two times, it could it could accentuate their powers drastically. This is what happened to the chimera, isn't it? Yeah, he says, he, you know, we examined the body of the chimera and it looked like somebody uh, basically gave it uh, this serum and embedded crystals into its body. Right. Uh, and then, you know, uh, to see what would happen. It was an experiment. And the experiment, in this case, succeeded. And that chimera had power, you know, I mean, I, we didn't fight it, so we don't know what happened. But would you say that it had powers beyond what a normal chimera would have? Yes. Yeah. So, like I said, eight times out of ten, application of this serum will kill the creature. Will, will kill whatever it touches. Two times out of ten. Time. Six or seven times works 100% of the time. Exactly. Like uh, Cole 45. Um, but a couple of, you know, every once in a while, it's going to react positively with a creature and, and essentially extend their abilities. If this is something that the, the what, what, um, what Quidness will say is, look, if this is something that they've, the, he goes, based on, the, based on the, the, the body of the Chimera, I don't think that they have perfected this yet. But they are getting they are getting there. If they are able to perfect this, where they can lower the death rate, and they can manufacture niahydrian crystal serum in quantity, that could be really bad. Because what they'll do is they'll just hand it out to every tiefling and demon that comes through the pipe. And if that's the case, these guys are going to be all mythic. Out, they're going to be all mythic out, and they're going to be they're they'll. I mean, it'll be a significant setback for the Crusaders because suddenly you've got. Uh, uh, an army of hulks. Any, okay, so that's that. Any questions about the nihydrian crystals? Just to make sure I understand that. You're saying they're trying to use these crystals for the good guys if they can get it to work. Is that what you're saying? No, the bad guys. So right, now, when, I, you said, when you said the crusaders, you went to the evil crusaders. I was thinking of this as the crusaders. Oh, no, I meant the, temp the Templars and the demons. Okay. That kind of stuff. So, yeah, so Niahydrian crystals are native to the, the Abyssal Plains. What they've somehow managed to do is distill the mutagenic properties that exist normally in these crystals into some sort of serum. And then they're giving that serum to creatures to see what happens. 80% of the time, it kills them. 20% of the time, it enhances their abilities significantly. Essentially, from, from our point of view, it, it mythics them. Uh, if they have, what Quidness would say is they haven't worked out all the bugs. They've still got an 80% death rate. And this, this serum is probably pretty significantly difficult to make. But if they, can, if they can streamline the process of making the serum and they can reduce the death rate, suddenly they'll be handing it out to all kinds of demons to mythic them out. And then the crusaders are going to have a real problem on their hands because what they'll essentially doing is they'll be hulking out demons and sending them into the battle against crusaders. Now the crusaders are just holding their own. Now, if suddenly you have a bunch of mythic out demons coming through here that have been enhanced by this niahydrian serum, that's going to be a big problem. All right. So that's one. The next thing he did is I went down into the basement and examined the corruption forge. Um, basically, this this forge, in its state that it is now, was used to transform holy magic items into unholy magic items that could then be utilized by de demonic forces. Basically, they were taking holy weapons, holy materials from captured crusaders, transforming them in this forge so that they could be used by demons without peril. Uh, 
But he goes, I have determined that with a bit of work, the forge can be exercised and realigned so that instead it can redeem evil magic items and allow them to be used by good characters. I'm working on a method to, to which we can redeem that forge, but I might need your help. I'm making some notes. Uh, I have some uh, notes on the creation that we found in Staunton's office uh, and that and from his journal. Um, Sure, you tell us this after we destroyed Shul, Shul Shear. <laughs> no kidding. Once the forge is redeemed, Quidness believes that it can be used to rework evil magic items into good magic items. An unholy weapon, for example, can be made into a holy weapon. A wand of unholy blight can be transformed into a wand of holy smite. Some evil magic items, such as a nine lives stealer or a dark skull, uh, don't have an obvious good analog. Right. In some cases... That in those cases, that would bring in, that it would be, you know, there's a sense of randomness that would that would that would accrue. But he's like, I'm going to work on how to figure out how do we change this forge over so that it, it can it can go from good to evil rather than evil to good. I'm going to try and change it from suck to blow, as a poem. <laughs> That's a classic line. <laughs> <laughs> But that's what Quidness has been working on for the last several days and what he's found out. Any questions for him? No? All right. Let's real quick. Yeah. Change subject. Um, no. If we've got stuff we want to sell, can we send it back with what's his name? Yeah, he won't be able to pay you now because he didn't bring right. it. Right. But he can, he can give you – I'll tell you what we can do is he can, he's, he's starting a goldsmith's here. Okay. Uh, well, silversmiths right now, but um, but essentially, Guerm is instituting banking in Dresden. Uh, so what he can do is he'll be able, he'll be able to first to issue you a draft on uh, on his new bank of Dresden um, for for the amounts that you agree on for sales, and then you can tr you can you can convert that. Certainly, you can convert that into whatever with him. But uh, as time goes by, you'll be able to trade it for goods and services in Dresden or Canabras. Um, okay. As if it was money. Ilandar is going to send him with some stuff, but okay. it's after me and the guys have an email chain this week. I'll tell you what that was. So you got to go through party booty and figure out what you're going to get rid of and what you're going to right. keep. Right. Yeah. Somebody well, don't forget to don't forget to add. Uh, we haven't looted the dwarven temple yet. We. I will get back to. Um, I will get back uh, to Chuck about the dwarven temple uh, early this week. And when I said loot, I mean. Carefully re re remove items of. of well, that's the best of themselves. I, I think everybody in the room knew exactly <laughs> what you meant. <laughs> it belongs Chose, in a museum. Chosen of Iomidae. <laughs> There's it's the, it's the, all the wine last night. It makes me it makes me crazy. All right. So, any questions on any of what we? I mean, I know I've thrown a ass load of material at you guys um any questions on anything that you guys ha that you know that has gone on not at the moment no it was disheartened when we met a new dwarf that uh, had the voice of uh, gordon out of it but uh but i'm hoping that we can turn that frown upside down when we, when we locate our old pal bardos well, so Harlakar and Ohm come to you uh, later that day that you talk with Guerm. And basically Harlakar says, look, I've been informed about what Queen Galfrey uh, wants, to, uh, wants you guys to do. And I think it's, I think it's a wise idea. You've done, you've done splendid here. Uh, and you have, uh, I mean, without, without your uh, guerrilla tactics, there's no way we'd be, we'd be standing here in the in the courtyard of Citadel Drazen, the old dwarven place, and with dwarves in it again. Uh, so I I uh, I don't underestimate your prowess, not in the least. But I do have a favor to ask you, and you've done me many favors so far, and I've asked this one boon of you. My my advisor, Captain Ohm, uh, whom you've spoken you've spoken with on a couple of uh, occasions, is a it's a doughty fighter. And a, a, and a good warrior. I think you'll find him useful and uh, and without uh, and without problem. Um, it's my request that you allow him to come with you 
uh, to accompany you on your investigations that you, uh, as you continue to uh, uh, engage in guerrilla activities behind the enemy lines. Um, as my representative and as uh, someone who can assist you in, uh, in battle. He's a, he's a stout warrior. You won't, uh, then he clouts uh, Ohm on the back. He's, and uh, he's one of my smartest advisors. Hurts me to send him with you, uh, I'll be honest. But here in Garrison, here, here in the Citadel, uh, I feel like um, I'll be okay. He, he can help you more than he can help me. What do you say? Good thing. <laughs> I think we're allergic to him. Come on now. <laughs> Give your balls oh. a talk and take him with you. We'll, we'll add to the charter that uh, the FUP, we'll just add an O on the end of FUP, and uh, that'll be for O, for Ohm. Welcome what aboard. Mean, what did you say? <laughs> I said, so it'll be known as a FUP since we're now one member short and he's joining us for the temperate and time being. We'll be FUPO. FUPO? <laughs> FUP plus O. <laughs> R plus L equals J. Uh, okay, so um, you guys are you guys are cool with that? Absolutely, it'd be great to excellent, have that. Excellent. Uh, and, uh, Wait, can Farina be mad at him now? <laughs> and distrustful? <laughs> no. Oh, no shit. That's yours. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I hate to say it, but I think uh, that's forever I think, yours. I think when it comes to Farina, uh, it's always going to be you, buddy. <laughs> yeah, I think she has to get the ninth level of to give this speech before she lets it go. <laughs> You're going to have to do her a really huge favor at some point. Uh, I'm not sure what that would entail that would keep her from, you know, hating you. But, uh, hating me, I know. <laughs> yeah, it, it's got to be something, and I'm not sure what. So. Yeah. She doesn't hate you, Adam. Yeah, she not trust you as far as she can throw you. <laughs> you, you just had to be chosen as her, her favorite enemy. And I just think stop going yeah. skip though would be a big step in the right direction. Would would be a big step in the right direction? Stop going schizo. <laughs> I, I didn't mean it. And, I from, didn't and from deep within the citadel, you hear the planetar's voice going, I already solved that. Yes, he did. <laughs> Anything he does now is just him being bitchy. <laughs> I can't say uh, Frida's too keen on picking up a dwarf in our party. I, I just started to get used to Bardos a little bit. <laughs> Boy, don't talk about the drow. I mean, he's... <laughs> well, he's got at least some elven blood in him. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, I mean, if I recall correctly, the dwar the elves hate the drow more than they hate any other race on Earth. Yeah, that's pretty... That's right. pretty yeah. Okay. Common drow, uh, and I am only half-elf, and he has proven to be worthy so again well farina maybe i mean uh i don't know you got to look back a little bit in your um family tree but maybe you're half elf and half dwarf <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a dwarf right a dwarf? could be something that's a welsh <laughs> <laughs> a dwarf uh, you know i saw a great uh a great uh thing written um a joke written by uh some guy from Britain. He says, uh, it basically it's like a British guy talking to a couple of girls. He says, Hey, do you two girls want to go get a drink? And, uh, uh, the girls go, we're from Wales. He goes, okay, do you two whales want to go get a drink? Um, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty solid. All right. So, uh, you guys have accepted the dwarf into your, into your group. Uh, and obviously, you've uh, spent the next six to seven hours, each of you telling him all your deepest, darkest secrets. No, um, we went right to the hazing rituals. What's next? Yeah, so you've got, so before you go full on to the bat, you know, what might be the Baphometians and to Bardos, um, one, so a couple of things. One, you don't know Bardos is there. All you know is South and West. You suspect that he might be in the clutches of the Baphometians. He is alive, but also Eustoriax, the shadow demon, is not on this plane anymore. So whatever has happened to Bardos, he he's has not, he's not, yeah, has unhappened. So Bardos is still alive. Baru could tell you that, but he can't tell you how close or how far he is. You have- As long as he can give us a basic general sense of direction, then yeah, we'll just keep 
beyond South and West, he can't. I mean, he really, he, he really can't. It's just not the nature of the that that companion relationship. He, it's not right. like a homing device. Can he keep telling us that though? Almost like a Geiger counter kind of a thing. Yeah, it'd be yeah. Like a, I mean, it'd be like of. a very vague um, compass. Yeah. So I can point exactly to him, but if we go like a day past him. Well, yeah. I mean, it's kind of going to be like say. that way. You know what I mean? Right. Um, yeah, and, and he will tell you South and West, which does admittedly seem to coincide with a bunch of things. Everybody says the Baphometians, the Templars, whenever they would take off, they would go south and west. The, um, the uh, Bardos is south and west. Um, the Tieflings will tell you that they thought that the Baphometian headquarters might be within a week's ride. Um, a horse will go 20 miles a day. The so week is 140 miles. Okay. That being the case, let's just take a look. So these are 12-mile things. So you're talking about almost the entirety of this map is yeah. within a week's direct ride. But you said for us to, to get everything that's in that hex, we got to spend one full day in that hex, right? You gotta, to, to, get, to get the hex, everything in the hex, to investigate the hex, you uh, have to spend a full day in the hex. So we're going to have to, okay, so... And so it's, like, it's, we, like, it's like what I was talking about. If you go in a straight line to somewhere... Then you go in a straight line to somewhere, and that's how it does. But you don't, uh, you don't get the investigative properties. You don't get to unleash the map. One last thing: we talked about how much, you know, how much food and water I have to bring for the horses. Let's say, for for argument's sake, we only bring pack animals, and and we we foot footed there. Uh, how far can we walk? That we we have to carry a lot less food and water. And we can put it on the pack animals, and when we have to cut them loose because we're going into some stealth mode. It's not as big a loss. So you're saying abandon the, abandon the horses and, uh, and and pack it in with maybe a couple of burrows? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm Less saying, said like, that we walk of, the horses go the same speed. Uh, yeah, I'm just wondering, like, how much how much uh, distance can you cover for, uh, in, in, your, in your estimate same, there? Same thing. If you're investigating, but, one hex per day. Now, if you're going in a linear fashion, that speed goes down quite a bit. Yeah, I'm talking linear. That's what I'm talking about, linear. Uh, walking, I believe it's... 12 miles a day one hex okay, so one hex a it's day. yeah from okay. from one okay. side of a hex to another and, and you guys you see what i'm saying here is like if we if we don't bring up horses we have a lot less to deal with we just bring burrows um and when we eventually have to cut them loose or we need to have like a couple of uh, guyers guys to come hang out with the horses or take them back when we're able to jump up because um, we're assuming at some point maybe that we're gonna have to go stealthy Oh, for an insertion into Bathmedian territory or whatever else we're going to do, which is going to be hard to do when we're riding, you know, in like the light, light, uh, the light brigade. But one, was there well, there's thing? total, total. There's seven of you, right? Now we have only us. Is that right? Yes, there's seven. Seven yeah. of you. So seven horses, and then a couple of burros. Um. One big say nine, nine or ten. Well, if we've got horses, we don't need the burrows. The burrows would be if we went out on foot. Well, it depends. I mean, so you, there was some initial loose talk about having a barrel uh, attached right. to it so you could put water in it. Pack, pack if pack if you could figure out a different way to do that, that would be okay. Something more. Uh, Love can make water at will, so. Right. Me too. What are you going to put in it? <laughs> <laughs> but you won't want to drink it. <laughs> The question was what to contain it in, right? So I can create, I think it's 15 gallons of water per level a day or something stupid. So All right. the, the question that's not, would be- That's not per day, that's per casting. Well, create water, you can that's just it. keep doing it. It's a zero level spell. So right. for uh, for humans, it's one, or uh, uh, humanoids, let me, let me say, I don't want to be uh, you know racist. Um, it's one gallon of water per day. For horses, did you say it was three gallons, Mike? Yeah. Three gallons per day? So was there's seven people, that. there were seven people, seven horses, two burrows. So it's nine times three is, I can't believe I can't fit in, 28 plus seven, 35 gallons. So if you, if you use horses, you're up to 35 gallons of water per day minimum. And it's not like you can count 15 gallons per gallon. Well, he's got it. Yeah, we can do that. Right. 
Okay. Water is not the issue. Food is. Yeah, food is the bigger issue. So what about food? Can you? It, well, he can make food, right? Okay. So at seventh level, he can he can cast uh, create food and water each time creates enough food for uh, twenty one people. Nice. What? Okay. There's what how many of us? There's seven plus seven. Eight. Okay, so that's seven of us plus two animals then, basically. What, what, wait a second. How much yeah, do horses eat? Each horse takes up the same equivalent of three humans. All right, same as water. So, uh, so again, you need 35. So you'd have to cast it five times Ooh, a geez, day. That's a lot. Yeah, right. So the math works Just better than the arrows, right? Why is it five times? Yeah, didn't you just say it was 12? It, that... it was 21, and we need 35, so two castings would be more than enough. Uh, three, 21. Oh, three, three castings. Three castings would put you to 36. No, two castings would put us to, I think I'd do 21. <laughs> three castings, you're right. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, I thought you said 12. No, it's 21. 21. Oh, yeah, then two castings will be more than enough. This video is going to make future generations weep on their math skills. It's gonna make us <laughs> yeah, but uh, create food and water is a third level spell. Right. How many of those do you have? Three. And if well, I use all three of them for there you go, plenty. And water, <laughs> then there's no chain of perdition, no searing light, no prayer. There's a lot right. of spells in that range that we no longer have access to. Right. So maybe if you could memorize one per day, and then we just pack in the rest with us to kind of supplement. Well, and I'm looking, there's a, a lower level spell that, as soon as I find it again. Well, just, just I mean, depending on the spells, I mean, the math works better bringing burrows than horses, right? Uh, burrows eat the same. No, they can just, about, carry, they can just carry more. I know, but I'm saying for our spell level, we can do. They eat the same, but there's a lot less of them. There's not seven more, seven so, more of them. So if oh, we do burrows, yeah, if we we do burrows and walk, we can do uh, all of us plus four pack animals with one casting a day. Well, and here's the other thing. There's a, a spell called abstemiousness, which magically enhances a handful of simple food and imbuing it with enough nutrition to satisfy a medium or smaller creature for a full day. And this, we're talking about a handful of berries, grains, nuts, or rice. So if you created food and then cast this on it, it would extend how many people could, it could feed nutritiously, right? Yeah, lambda spread. Does, does created food, so like create food and water, does that have a time delay on it? Like at some point it disappears? Yeah, after a day. 24 hours. Yeah, 24 same hours. Same okay. thing with the water. The water that you create with that zero level spell, if you don't use it within a day, disappears. It right. vaporizes, okay. So I could do one third level spell for create food and water, and then this first level spell to enhance a small handful of food to make it create or make it uh, sustain far greater number of people. That would work. So those two spells would get us, even with, the, even with all of us having horses then. So one third, one first level, and then we could all have horses. Right. Now, the first level spell, what's it called? Um, you're going to make me try to pronounce this again. Abstemiousness. Uh, there, well, there we go. That looks right. <laughs> Don just wanted to hear you say it again. Abstemiousness was actually, the reason I know this word is because it was actually considered to be one of a virtue of uh, uh, monks in the medieval period. Mm. It's the root word is abstain. Oh, well, it's not the root word, but they come from the same root. Right. I would, I would say let's do that, and then what we do is we pack in, I don't know, a week's worth of rations, because we got horses, so they can carry all kinds. Um, and then we use your spell while we're just traveling, and then when we get close to where we're going, then we switch to using rations. That way you can memorize 100% of your spells as whatever we need for adventuring. Okay. okay. That first level spell is only going to do that enough for one person. Yeah, so that would have to be cast multiple okay. times. So that may not work. Like I said, we got horses. Rations don't weigh a ton. 
Uh, and actually, uh, they weigh uh, one pound per day's worth of food. Right. Which a horse can carry a ton of that. Yeah. So we bring the food, and you know what? You can supplement. They create water. You, yeah. Yeah. You can create water, and we can supplement pure travel days with your spells. But yeah, I would. I would count mostly if we're taking horses. I would count mostly on the stuff we pack with us. Okay, I just need to know which spells you want me to create or want me to, to memorize. I have create water, so we're good there. I can create fourteen gallons of water with each casting, each and, casting. It's a, and it's a free spell. It's a zero level spell. Yeah. You drown us if you want. Yeah. Horses stand five to six feet tall at the shoulder and weigh between a thousand and fifteen hundred pounds. I don't see how much they can carry though. Hold on a second. I'd probably be a product of their strength. Game terms, because that's what it is for us. Yeah. Plus what, Pete, what Pete they took, right? Okay. So according to this, their strength is sixteen, which doesn't make a ton of sense. From but they get, they get bonuses for being a quadruped, though. And also a large size, right? Uh, yep. Okay, let's say they carry 50 pounds of food. That's enough for 50 days for each person, right? Each person has a horse with 50 pounds of food on it, so they've got enough food for 50 days, correct? Right, yeah. Trail rations okay. weigh one pound per day. Okay, so casting, uh, create food and water, would one casting of that would feed all seven of our horses. So if we pack in enough food for us, we can create food and water for the horse. Okay. You got a plan? As long as you don't pick someone else up. That's a good that's a good point. What if you find Bardos? You have to drag him back. Feed him. I said I said we have to bring him empty we have to bring well, empty horse for Bardos. Okay, so we do have fifty pounds of food in that scenario. We have enough food for a person. Sure. That's a good point. So you're talking about so Unless I'm reading you wrong, you're not talking about making forays from Citadel Drazen and coming back to the Citadel after doing this. You're talking about long distance, out on the, you know, living out on the trail uh, <laughs> in stealth for long, for relatively long periods of time. I'm I'm thinking that we have enough food for long periods of time, but we might only be gone for a week, two weeks, something like that. Yeah, I think just we want to just be prepared of what our options are and do the math now, so we don't have to worry about it later on when we're out, out there. Okay. Plus, I find this whole this mountain whole math sub campaign super super hilarious. So, wait, what? Of this, you don't like my math? No, I love it. Uh, this is my favorite part. Like, I'm I'm t we're all tired now. Like, okay, so carry the three, add this, and I have <laughs> the water. Yeah, we need an accountant on this party. Do you guys know any accountants that love D and D? We should get them in here. <laughs> yeah, all right. All of them. So do you think you guys have a idea about the food and water? Yeah. Let's go. Yeah, don't, worry, the week. don't worry about right, it. You, don't think about it again. So let me ask, are you guys taking horses or just burrows? Horses. Horses? I, think our horses, I would counsel that we don't take horses that we're super fond of because what if we have to leave them behind or, or send them back here? Yeah, there is. There comes a point where we might have to go in and invade somewhere, and yeah, that means the horses are left somewhere. Right, exactly. Except and, for Flashwood. Aren't we going to investigate as we go? So if we're going to walk anyway, why do we need to bring the horses? If we had a cohort, we could leave the cohort with the horses. Yeah. <laughs> no, no cohort. <laughs> uh, we're going to take horse, horse cohorts. <laughs> I just no think cohorts. If we run out of food, we have horses, so therefore we have food. There you go. It's on the hook. They replenish themselves. Bring some sheep and goats with you too. We have to drive a flock of, of goats and sheep in front of us as we go. Chickens and geese. Yeah, yeah that kind of thing. All right. All right. Sounds like you guys uh, got a plan. So um, horses and uh, yeah. 
Let me let me throw another uh, uh, monkey wrench in it. Um, what are you guys thinking about doing from the point of view of stealth? Now you're going to be investigating these hexes. Now, in some cases, there may be instances where you don't necessarily want to investigate, but you want to uh, drive straight through. Now that will be if you get information of some location and you want to get there fast. But in the meantime, you're going to be investigating behind enemy lines. How stealthy do you want? To be? This party is not stealthy. No, but we do have aerial mm -hmm. recon. We do have multiple aerial recons, so Okay. Yeah. The, oh yeah, by the by the way, I don't did we uh, did we talk about um, Storm's food supply? Storm doesn't need food. Storm doesn't need food. No, nope. Storm's an idol. Will she eat like uh, dust and crackers? She sure. goes back to her plane to eat. Yeah, okay. When, when, so that's a great question. When does she do that? Whenever. So sometimes, so like at night, you just send her back and then re resend her. Re right. Her and if I forget to, as soon as I'm unconscious, so basically as soon as I fall asleep, then she winks out. She disappears. Okay. All right. Good to know. Uh, does she use a potty on the airplane? Huh? I said, does she use a potty on the airplane? <laughs> yeah, I taught her to potty on her own time. <laughs> She's, she's a um, all she right, does, so she does have a proclivity for aiming for paladin armor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you don't even want to know some of the things that have happened to paladins in our other campaign. No, I, it was it was a rough time. Uh, okay, so so you guys may have solved the the food and water aspect. Um, you're going to take horses. Yes. Yep. 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 What are you guys going to do from the point of view of, so the, the, I mean, so there's a couple of things that you can try to do. I mean, you want to try and track the Anis Hag? You want to go straight into Baf Baphometian territory and see if this whole south and west thing is, is really for real? The so south and west thing is what Illinois is going to push for because he wants Bardos back. Yeah. I agree. And that's, a, that's a solid lead, and I think we want to pursue that first. And actually, my, my take on it would be I'd like to go this. Well, that's not even the right thing. Okay, that's not it either. It doesn't matter who would remember the party got pulled away like this. So we think we'd all pull together to try to retrieve them if we could. Yeah, my take would be to try to go this way. So if we're investigating, we can stop by this tomb and see what's there. And then. That's number two. <laughs> that's what? That's, that's number two. two. No, there's a, there's enough number two around here to go around. <laughs> right. Got to get a, so, got to get a Rick so, Steve's version of the of the planes here. So if we, uh, hold on. So so what's I mean? So what's your plan, Lothar? I mean, you think Delamere's tomb is is a place where I mean, it is a temple of Arastal, and as far as you know, there's that Jesker guy who's supposed to be running it, although nobody's talked to him for a while. It could could be something, could be nothing. Right. Well, so what we, I'm thinking is, is we can see what's there, and then we have a, a short, I mean, it's kind of the same thing if we went to here and did that, but then we have a short trip to come back up here, and by the time we're two octagons down, we can see what Baru has to say about the direction then. If it's yeah, we still, start to triangulate. If it's still south and west, then we're looking at all of this down here. But if once we get here, he says, okay, now it's north and west, or right. just west. Or just west, then we've got a, a we've got a better line in on where. Yeah, we start to now. triangulate. It's yeah. a good idea. Well, now that now that Gordon has a different character, you know, at least temporary or for forever, who knows? I'm I'm more okay with that plan than before because to meta game for a second, we could be we, that could open a whole new quest line that we'd be doing for the next six months. We don't know if we go to that temple, but I'm fine with that. Just playing the character, Ilandar's going to be politely pushing as much as he can to go after Bardos. Well, yeah, and that's kind of the, where I am as well. But right now we have South Yeah, I, I agree that this, this so place is, is on the way. If we go here, then we, we have, yeah. at that point, either still south or west, or now north and west. Right. With a fairly short jaunt and looking in on, on this area to see if there's anything beneficial for us there. Yep, so I agree. That's pretty much on the way, and it helps helps you out. So, so I'm I'm 100 good with that. I'm just I was talking more to what Matt said. If we get there, and oh, he's got a quest for us, 
that Elnar is going to be like, great, we'll do that after we find Bardos. Right. Well, we don't even know if that guy's still alive or if that temple right. still stands or any of it. Okay. Yeah, that tomb is south and west anyway, so that's two birds with one stone as far as I'm concerned. If the tomb is still there and in and it is indeed a temple of Arastal, it might be a safe place where you guys could use as a secondary base of operations too. That would be welcome. Right. right. I'm sure uh, Guerin would be excited to open a new uh, trade route area. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a tomb, so I don't know there's like a ton of people there, but... Um... Hey, I'm dead or people too, my friend. Yeah, but if it's still there and if it's still consecrated, then it could be of benefit. Good, yeah. Probably. I don't know, what do you guys think? It's a, it's a, it seems like a solid plan. Or do you guys no. want to just like truck into Baphometian territory? No, Anybody else? good with it, it makes sense. Or do you want to follow the Anis Hag, try and find this succubus who, by rumor, has it that she knows exactly where the Baphometian HQ is? But we don't know where she is. No, that's true. She's at uh, this tomb. <laughs> it's I'll play my Friday night character. Well, no, the Anis Hag Definitely. set out due west. So um, it's, it's possible she's out that way. So I heard this. Uh, yeah, okay, but uh, I think yeah, let's hit the tomb. Let's see how, how is that one. That's like basically a day. You you know, I, it looks like I it's. Think, it I think the succubus went due west to here, but then turned due south and then came here. We were twenty miles a day. Twelve. No, well, on a horse we go on, on, a, on a on a horse is twenty. Yeah, so we are horses, you're so it's probably 20. looking at yeah, it's it's a long day, but you can get there in a day. And this square here is already, we already see what's there, right? So that's yeah, not it's open. Yeah, it's cover. Open, open territory. You don't have to investigate. So yeah, right. you, could, you could get to Delamere's in a day. Little little over a day yeah, of riding. You could get there. I'm going to take you aside for a second. The flashcard is to just ask you if, uh, if you, you know, your God's speaking to you in any manner about this tomb that you said they have. No. Okay. It just seems like a likely first starting uh, starting point. Cool. Just want to know, you know, I'm chat with my God, so maybe maybe yours was, you know, throwing you a bone. I wouldn't care. All right. Well, any other things that you guys want to do while you're still at Citadel Drazen? Equipment you want to buy from from Horgus? Um, things you want to take care of? Um, when you say mundane, does that include masterwork? No, it does not. Uh, if you want a regular old dagger, you can get a regular old dagger. But a masterwork thing, I mean, the, frankly, the blacksmiths here just haven't been able to been able to get up to speed. And in Canaveras, you could probably get something like that, but they would not have sent something like that. It, there's just no way to get them put together. And they didn't know that there would be a market for it. I do have one request from Guerm. I'd see if he can give us a price on and availability on. I mean, he's he's a quartermaster who's trying to supply a, a you know a godforsaken land here, so he must have already thought through how to how to supply a certain group of people for a certain amount of time, right? So, is there a magic item or something we we could take on for so we don't have to try to do this math in the future? You know, like the horn. No, not, not right now. Um, basically, he packed in a lot of like food, equipment, clothing, that kind of stuff. This is all Monday. Up. This is this is initial. I mean, so the moment, so basically, what he had been to, to give you an idea what Guerm's been doing. He it, he's in Canabra. So uh, you guys take off a couple of weeks ago, and he's he's been trying to write, build, rebuild his business. He's been getting his contacts in together. He's been he's been talking to the Queen's emissaries. He's been talking to some suppliers in Numeria and Mendev to try and get things back on because he's. At that point, he's trying to supply Canebras. So What's his name again? Horgus Guerm. Okay. So he's trying to supply, he's trying to build his business back up in Canebras. Then suddenly he hears, oh my God, these guys that I know have, um, have uh, taken the Citadel Drazen 90 miles from here. There's a supply line that goes along the River Selen, uh, with with various places along the way, which are going to have guys there. He's like, 
I see opportunity. So he ups his orders from his guys in New Marion and Mendev. He builds his things and he sets off to try and do that. He connects with Irabet Tirablay and he says, I'm going to, I'm bringing a bunch of supplies to you in, Citadel, in the Citadel. You're the warden of, of Dresden. Uh, I will make a deal with you. I will be your sole supplier and I will guarantee that you will get supply lines once every week, once every two weeks, whatever it's going to be, and make sure that you can, you have the foodstuffs you need to handle nearly a thousand guys in Citadel Dresden so that we can hold this place. So he's seeing it as an opportunity because now he's a, he's a military supplier. Uh, he's a defense contractor, right? So he's pulling right. he's got all his suppliers. He's pulling in, he's getting horses, he's getting wagons. Um, this is it. But yeah, this first, his first run is not going to have things like masterwork weapons or magic items or things like that. He's just yeah. trying to get as much food and water there as possible. No, I was just saying, if we could send a note back with him. Oh so yeah, absolutely. Think about this. What kind of, what kind of uh, item or is there available for smaller parties to go out there and not have to worry about food or water while they're creeping around this horrible place? He can take a look and try and find something. That's what I'm saying. I'm putting, in a, I'm putting yeah. in an order and asking if there's pricing could be, it could availability. Be weeks. It could be weeks before he, for, before he can put that together, but he's happy to look. Because he's got the leadership feet, so he's got cohorts of people, right, that are helping He's got him. guys he's bought. I mean, he's basically rebuilt his, his, his guys. Um, you know, when Canaveris was destroyed, you guys brought him out of those caves. He, his vault hadn't been looted. He still had all of his gold and, and, you know, all of his working cash. I mean, he was set, I mean, he was set on his heels because most of his warehouses had been burned. People had looted that kind of stuff, but he was able to rebuild. And now he's in a position where he can, he can do a lot of, uh, you know, uh, he has the connections. He's got the money. He's got the connections. He can put these things together. He can probably get that for you. It's just a matter of how long it will take. Yeah, right, that's all I'm asking. Okay. And then finally, for the Baphomedians, were they all human? Not humanoid, but humans? The Baphomedians were all human, no tieflings. How many humans are in this party besides myself? Well, that's a good question. I don't know. Uh, Lothar's a human. I'm human. Gotta are you? Gotta a half elf. Half. Half elf, okay. Karina's half uh, is an elf. Half, half elf. elf. We got a uh, drow. Is that it? You and you and uh, Lothar are the only humans in the party? I'm half. What was Bardos? That doesn't count. Bardos, uh, Bar Bardos, you're not sure. He wasn't elf. He wasn't human. You're not, I mean, he looked okay. like a human, but he didn't act like a human. And he, he didn't. He was, he after also, he was Robo Robocop, I forgot. Yeah, he was kind of like Robocop. Uh, all right. So the, the reason I'm asking is for Lothar and I, uh, I'm going to pack on some. Baphomedian foul Baphomedian gear that we have you know lying around the fortress here just for an infiltration uh, infiltration possibility oh, I don't want to okay because I, I you know I also added more to my bluff on this uh, when I went to level seven so I'm ready for this <laughs> so do you guys so as both of you so as you as a paladin of Iomade and Lothar as a cleric of Arastal are you guys going to be comfortable pretending to be Baphomedians? I mean, wearing their wearing their. Um... I would like to remind you of a precedent that I've not done this once, but twice before. All right, I'm obviously your, your your moral structure is a little loose. So what about what about uh, that, that what comes about as a surprise to no one? Yeah, it, it will depend on the situation. As a general rule, probably not. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't think we have to. I don't want to pass full muster and you know and become a you know an infiltrator. But if we can slip through the lines as faux Baphomedian, um, doing the old uh, "we got the Wookie arrested uh, on the Death Star" move, I think that might work out for us uh, at some at some future date. So okay. this is a contingency plan. This is not a plan. Okay. All right. Lothar, very quickly, I'd like you to do a. Do you have knowledge local? No. What What are your knowledge skills? Uh, planes, nature, religion. Give me a knowledge religion. And uh, so here's here's what I'm going to do. As you, as you were talking to these guys about going to Delamere's, one of the things that you're interested in is finding out a little bit more about this Jesker Helton guy. And you want to find out. All right. So DC... Uh, uh, so 22, there's several pieces of information. As you go through various, um, you, you talk to some people, you go through that library that uh, Valentin was looking at, and you find out a couple pieces of information. 
So here's what you find out about Jessica Helton. First, uh, he was a relatively young, relatively handsome cleric who had joined the crusade because of his interest in the old Tarkarian worship of Erastal. Um, he recently was mourning, well, recently would be four to five years ago, was mourning the loss of a precious heirloom, his mother's wedding ring, which he had kept with him. Um, there aren't a lot of Erastal worshipers in Dresden, but those who are here, which you talked to, all mentioned that the consecration of the, the shrine at Delamere's, uh, after so many years in demonic hands, has been, um, you know, something that they all wish would happen. Um, the problem is, and they'll tell you this, it's, it's very strange that these Aristotelians among the Crusaders will tell you that, you know, when they talk about uh, going to Delamere's and that kind of stuff, they find that, um, you know, uh, uh, their holy symbols get cracks in them. Um, and that, you know, they've noticed that holy water gets, gets corrupted. It's very strange, that, especially so far away from the tomb, but they, they swear that it's happening. Um, you know, that there are some sort of, and the way that it's characterized you is that there's some sort of unquiet echoes coming from Delamere's tomb. Um, you meet one person. Uh, who's at Citadel Drazen, who's one of the people who's... So So one of the things that's been happening over the last week is that various people from the hinterlands have been coming into Drazen, people who have been living on their own, people who have been hiding from the demons, that kind of thing. Uh, one of these people is a worshiper of Arastal, and uh, you, fi you eventually find her and interview her, and she says that she actually saw Jesker about six months ago, uh, and that he came to her and talked to her uh, in ways that bordered on the flirtatious, which would have been um, very uh, out of character for him. He was always described in the, in the books that you've read as very charming and kind, but uh, this woman reports feeling very uncomfortable uh, with him, and this is only six months ago, so he's there six months ago. Um, but this is not, uh, what is reportedly his normal behavior. Um, so you get two pieces of information for her. One, he's a lot, uh, at least he was alive six months ago. And two, he's acting very strangely. Okay. Okay. So he was normal and very pious six, you know, prior to that. And now he's, yeah, well, so people had seen him. So this is, this is, uh, you know, this is, this is Lothar basically uh, uh, talking to anybody who will talk to him and doing research to find out more about this Delamere's tomb. Um, most people will tell you they hadn't seen or heard from this guy for five or six years, but this woman that you find out, and this is, this is uh, after Citadel Drazen uh, is taken by the Crusaders, there's this sort of like weird, um, you know, sort of flow of people into Dresden who uh, were out in the hinterlands, right? So they were hiding from the demons and that kind of stuff. But now that they know that they can, they can get, uh, you know, they, they can get safety here, they can get food here. They're, they're starting to come in. And, and so Lothar finds this one woman who's been out in the, in the wilderness, in the wasteland for a while. And he interviews her. And basically she says, yeah, I saw Jessica Helton six months ago, or six months ago. And, uh, you know, I, I knew of him. Uh, she's an arrestal worshiper. Um, what she tell you is that it was, you know, her encounter with him was very creepy and that it wasn't anything like what she had been given to understand about this guy. So it tells you a couple of things. Everything in the, in the book says that this guy is a very upstanding, very righteous guy. Um, but the behavior that she describes is not that way. But it also tells you that this guy's alive, at least as of about six, seven months ago. Right. But he's behaving strangely. He's behaving strangely, yeah. She would tell you she was very uncomfortable around him. Like, um, you know, not so much. It, yeah, I mean, somewhat sexually, and then he was, he was talking to her in a, a sexually suggestive way, but she just felt like he was erratic. Um, unpredictable, dangerous. She got out of there. Now, keep in mind, this is a woman who lives in the in in the world wound. She has been hiding from demons. She has been foraging for food. 
her, her impressions and observations of things might be suspect. This is this is someone who's a uh, a refugee, a wastrel. But, she but she, is a, worship, she a, is a worshiper of a rascal, which you, you can confirm. So She lives out here. She's basically a, a road warrior. Yeah, basically. This is not a, this is not a, a the, the marshlands are not a place uh, that people generally live. All right. Well, I think we're, the one, one other thing that occurred to me is I would love to take a tea thing with us. He might have, he might have seen some of these things we're heading towards before, but I can't think of how we can give one parole and trust them even a whit. It's like we talked about last week. These, these tieflings, these are bad guys. They work for demons. They worship demons. Uh, they got no love for you guys. Uh, now they're talking because um, they'd like to live. They like to live, and they and, and they and they know now that they're not going to be summarily executed. But, um, but that said, these are bad guys. So yeah. if you want to take one with you, I mean. You're going to be in a position where you're like going to have to guard them, and you're going to have to be questioning whether or not they're giving you right information. Honestly, one of these guys is going to betray you at the first moment. Yeah, it's a full golem on us. Yep. All right. The, All right. Uh, okay. Never mind. All right. So it is eleven o'clock. A uh, lot of information. A right? lot of stuff. Send me emails with questions. I, I know that there's going to be various emails going back and forth from you. I have a couple of things that I need to get back to you guys about, which I will do so ASAP. Awesome. Unless, just to FYI, um, yeah. there were several things that we did as we came through here that we were moving really fast to take the castle that we said we were going to come back properly in loop. Okay. Remind me of those you, things and I will get you that loop. The, where we, the couple we got got all, all of them. But I remember like, I remember one, for instance, I remember... We grabbed a few things that was up by the chimera. Okay, I will. We, uh, I will. I will go through and I will. I will get you a list. So is yeah. that everything? I mean, all the people we said we were going to come back and see what they had on them, but we were in combat, Mike, so we didn't stop yeah. for the weekend. I'll do that. Yeah, Mike. Mike, did we also say we we're going to go back to the temple where we got God originally? We found God originally, and that felt like we we cleared that out and put some guards on it. We we sanctified it, but we didn't loot it. Right. And so, yeah, I don't remember what was in the, the, I don't remember the items well, that, that were in that the- That might be gone now, but- No, the tomb fine. that we're supposed well, the, to get, and then plus- The tomb is fine, I'm talking about the temple. Yeah, I'm talking about a different right. where we found God, I remember. That's way yeah. back. That's so the, the temple. temple. The temple, uh, we did everything as we left. And, and other people probably went through there and got everything. Well, yeah, 500 dwarves came through there, plus Arabet. Well, we also left uh, crusaders there too. Remember, we left some, some uh, volunteer crusaders there. Sure, that's true. Because we had to re we had to reconsecrate the shrine. But, we but that stuff, we would have taken everything as we left. Gotcha. It's that kind of it's that kind of stuff that. All right, let me let me look. And, we just kind of said we're going to come back and do this, but we never touched on it. Okay, let me put through a list, and uh, we can we can debate it. Okay. All right, so, cool. All right, good night, guys. All right, good night, guys. Everybody, Les, Les, can you hang on one sec? Yeah. yeah. See you guys. Bye. Just want to know if you had a chance to connect with uh, that uh, dude's HR.